OK, good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones that they may have or other electronic devices. And our first piece of business today is to decide whether to item five in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members are agreed. Our second item of business is to continue to take evidence as part of an inquiry into Scotland's fiscal framework. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting today uh, David Phillips and uh, Professor Alan Trench. Good morning to you both. Uh, both witnesses have provided uh, papers in advance of giving evidence. So we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And as you'll know, I'll ask some opening questions. And um, then we'll go around the table. OK, so first one, I think, we'll, uh, we'll look at your own paper first, David. Uh, obviously, uh, Alan, you can feel free to comment, you know, uh, as we go along um, with David's paper and vice versa when I'm touching on, on, on your own uh, memorandum. And the uh, first thing I want to, to talk about is um, the no detriment principle. Um, you've talked in your paper uh, about no detriment, such that you've said, and I quote, uh, the key point is um, not possible to design a system that meets both no detriment principles and is at the same time transparent, effective and mechanical. But it is possible to design a system that is broadly fair if one is more flexible about the no detriment uh, principles. Such flexibility will be key to implementing a workable system. And you have went on in your paper to explain why there are contradictions within what Smith has actually said in terms of no detriment. But I'm just wondering if you can expand a wee bit upon that for the, the record. OK, yes. So um, uh, the, the, the two no detriment principles, well, kind of three, but uh, the, the, the framing is two. Uh, so the first no detriment principle is that um, when a uh, tax is devolved to Scotland, um, uh, Scotland shouldn't be made better or worse off just from the devolution of that tax. What that implies is, is that you take off the block grant, the amount of revenues you devolve to that. Now, the way I've interpreted uh, that as well is that the, the, the kind of spirit of that principle also means that in the years ahead, that Scotland uh, shouldn't be worse or better off if things would have kind of continued on as as they were going to anyway. So if the Scottish economy performs in line with the UK economy, Scotland shouldn't be made worse or better off under the, under the devolution there as well. It seems in the spirit of that first, you know, no detriment principle. Um, the second no detriment principle is that if a uh, policy decision is made in um, uh, Westminster... Um, that shouldn't make Scotland uh, better or worse off if it's for a, an area of devolved competency. Uh, and likewise, uh, if a policy is made in um, uh, Hollywood, that shouldn't uh, have an adverse or, or positive impact on the budgetary position of the UK government. Um, and uh, what I did in my uh, presentation and uh, in, uh, kind of summarised in my submission uh, was uh, kind of show examples where those, those two um, uh, principles can, can conflict. And uh, one of the reasons behind that is the, um, the differences in um, uh, the relative size of the tax bases in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Uh, so to give an example, um, uh, income tax revenues in Scotland are about 15% less uh, per person than they are in the rest, uh, than in the UK as a whole. Um, so... Looking at the, the first no detriment principle, uh, to satisfy that, you'd want a mechanism whereby if Scottish revenues grew in line, you know, say in percentage terms, uh, at a similar rate to those uh, in the rest of the UK, Scotland would be uh, no better off or no worse off. So say if revenues went up by 10% in Scotland and 10% in the UK, you'd want a mechanism that meant Scotland you know, didn't suffer detriment uh, because it's, it's growing in line with the UK, it shouldn't, it shouldn't suffer detriment under, under that. Uh, principle. Um, okay, you can design a mechanism that does that. Uh, the mechanism would be that when you take off uh, in, in year one, you, you take off uh, an amount of the block grant, and then in subsequent years, you index that by indexing it to the percentage growth in revenues in the rest of the UK. So if revenues got by 10% in the rest of the UK, you take that initial block grant reduction and increase that by 10%. So you're now taking 10% more off the block grant than you were originally. What that means is that if revenues got by more than 10%, Scotland gains, less than 10% loses, but if it grows in line with the UK, 
it doesn't lose. So that kind of satisfies the spirit of the first no detriment principle. But suppose there was a change in tax policy in the rest of the UK, which was to, um, it was, uh, that, that was the reason why um, tax revenues were to um, go up by uh, 10%. They take that 10% uh, additional revenue in the rest of the UK, put it into the Barnet formula. Scotland gets, Scotland would get more under the Barnet formula then it would have additional amount taken off its block grant. So what would happen under that circumstance is that Scotland would uh, gain from a tax increase in the rest of the UK. That's not a detriment to Scotland, but it is a detriment to the rest of the UK um, because Scotland is gaining from additional taxes that are being paid in the rest of the UK from a tax increase in the rest of the UK that's not in Scotland. So that doesn't satisfy the second no detriment principle. So... The, it's hard to do this in kind of words. Uh, it's easier to kind of have an example written down. But um, there's, you know, the one, different methods of adjusting the block grant satisfy different principles. You can satisfy the first one, the no detriment just through the act of devolution, but you, th 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 then the methods that will satisfy that don't satisfy the, the uh, no detriment from policy action uh, principle. And, and vice versa, you can, you can work it out. So um, in the presentation I, I forwarded uh, to the committee, there's, there's some worked examples that, that show that. Um, so, um, yeah, it's my view that you can't satisfy both, but you can satisfy one, and then it's a choice of, of which of the principles you prioritise. Thank you for that. That's quite clear. Professor Trench, what's your view on that? Um, issue? I think I would very largely agree with, with, with that. Um, the, I, th the problem, I, I think no detriment is a perfectly sensible high-level policy objective. I'm not sure that it's a workable practical principle to use um, in any system, but particularly one that is designed to work in a mechanical way. The principle by its nature is going to be pretty subjective in its application, and it's hard to see how it can serve that purpose. Now, if we think about the history of, of, the, no, of the idea of no detriment, um, the first time I'm aware of its use at all was in the context of um, what's now the Scotland Act 2012, the command paper published in November 2010 um, that set out the framework for that said there will be a no detriment principle to adjust um, the, the impact of UK tax decisions on the Scottish income tax take from the Scottish rate of income tax. Um, and my reaction on seeing that was to regard that as a, um, as a, as a, as a very broad and potentially dangerous principle. And of course, what, what subsequently happened was that um, the Treasury went away. They looked at the work that had been done in a Welsh context about similar proposals by the uh, Independent Commission on Funding and Finance in Wales, chaired by Gerald Holtham, who was, of course, originally, I think, I expect to give evidence today, and I believe has sent a note to the committee. Um, and that helps resolve a lot of those problems because he formulated the principle of the index deduction approach that, that, uh, that, that Mr. Phillips has talked about. That, as it were, got, got solved one, one sequence of problems. The difficulty now is partly that excessive weight is being put on, um, uh, on the principle in general, and partly that excessive weight is being put on the index deduction method. Now, the analysis that the, that the Holton Commission carried out was a very careful one, and it said quite clearly, there are a number of ways you can calculate the reduction from the block grant and adjust it, and different ones will be appropriate for different taxes because of the different profiles of risk that are involved. And the logic of the index deduction method is essentially that it puts much of it leaves with the Scottish um, exchequer much of the responsibility for dealing with with the consequences of devolved Scottish decisions, but it keeps at UK level um, and therefore protects Scotland from cyclic decisions that the UK government is much would be responsible for under under the, the current arrangements and under the, the arrangements it set out. That situation starts to change the more fiscal devolution we talk about. Whether index deduction is the appropriate method to use for other other taxes is one big question. Um, and um, 
with whether and when you need to use the no detriment principle in this way is the second question, and that's the bit that, that I think is particularly difficult. So, you want to come back in there? Yes, I think I have a slightly easier way of explaining what I was trying to get at in the first answer, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think the, the fundamental issue relates to the different ways in which the Barnett formula and the, um, the index deduction methods can work. So the reason you can't satisfy the two principles is, is thus. The Barnett formula works on a changes in spending on a pounds per person basis. If you want to satisfy the second no detriment principle, the one that, you know, if you have a policy change in England, um, that doesn't have detriment in Scotland, you need your indexation for the, 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 the block grant reduction to also work on a pounds per person basis, so it offsets the Barnett formula. But because a given percentage growth in revenues in Scotland is less in pounds per person, doing, doing things on a pounds per person basis would mean that if revenues in Scotland grew at the same rate as in England, Scotland would lose because it's a lower growth in per pounds terms and therefore you know, you, your per pounds growth in revenues wouldn't be as fast as the per pounds increase in the, the block grant reduction. So doesn't satisfy the, 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 the second, second principle. On the other hand, if you do the indexation of the block grant reduction on a percentage basis, well then that is different to the Barnett formulas per pounds basis, so you, you, uh, yeah, you, you don't satisfy the other no detriment principle. Um, so it's all to do with the fact that Barnett is per pounds per person, and the most sensible way to do the indexation, in my view, is likely to be on a percentage basis, given that, you know, a given percentage growth in Scottish revenues is different in, in per pounds uh, terms. So it's all to do with Barnet and the block grant reductions, you know, being on different bases. That's why you can't satisfy the, the two principles at the same time. Yeah, percentage growth, of course, so that would surely be impacted by demographic means. I mean, for example, if the population grew as a proportion higher than in another, you know, in, in, in the UK as a whole, as opposed to Scotland, that would also have an impact, would it not? Uh, that could have an impact. Um, now, there's, 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 a, there's a real debate about whether, the, well, there's a real question about whether or not um, the indexation method, method should, uh, should account for the demographic change. Uh, I think there's kind of uh, two points uh, uh, worth uh, mentioning there. First is that the Barnett formula on the spending side doesn't account for differential population growth. Uh, it does uh, update the population factors every uh, couple of years, but it never updates um, the, the baseline spending. It only applies to the, the increment. So, in effect, it doesn't account for differential population growth. So, you could say, well, if the spending side doesn't account for differential population growth, uh, should the tax side as well? Or are you just kind of picking the, 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 the two the, the ways that benefit Scotland as opposed to the ways that are consistent. Secondly, I think as one of the other people giving evidence suggested was that um, if you account for differential population growth in the indexation, you remove any incentive Scotland has to actually improve its demographic um, uh, uh, profile. So for instance, you know, the Scottish Government has said that it would like to see faster growth in the working age population in Scotland. Uh, if you uh, adjusted the, um, uh, the, the indexation method for, for the population growth, Scotland will get no benefit from that. So, the, 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 you know, on the one hand, adjusting population growth would, would benefit Scotland. It would mean, you know, you take less of the block grant because you're accounting for the fact that Scotland's population is growing less quickly. But it wouldn't be consistent with the Barnett formula, and it would remove incentives uh, to grow the grow the population, um, which the Scottish government said it would like to see faster pop. Well, it would like to see uh, a better demographics in Scotland. Thank you. Now, Alan, you've helpfully said uh, an independent body should be set up to help <laughs> to resolve disputes. Yes. And given what we've just heard, I think that would be very helpful. You've also <laughs> uh, said that uh, we should keep systems under regular review rather than believing uh, that a system can be reduced and simply left to work. Yes. Would you like me to elaborate on that? Yeah. Those? I think we have... We, we, let's take the first point. I think we have a fundamental problem with the institutions that we use to deal with, with, with financial matters at the, uh, by now. Um, these have been apparent for some time, but they have now become acute. Um, the as, as you, you will know, essentially we have one institution that does all these things at the moment. It's called HM Treasury. 
um, and it is also the finance ministry, as it were, for England, as well as for the UK as a whole. And the, the, the whole system rests on nothing more than a Treasury statement of funding policy. Um, it doesn't have a direct statutory or constitutional underpinning. It operates through the mechanism of annual supply and appropriations act at Westminster. Um, and any disputes, disagreements need to be raised with the Treasury first. And if one could really be, be bothered, they can be pressed in due course subsequently to the Joint Ministerial Committee and its dispute resolution mechanism. And um, to be blunt, a fat lot of good that is likely to do anyone other than Treasury. Um, what I think we need are going to be at the very least, at the very least, two new bodies, um, both of which I'm afraid for Treasury will impinge on Treasury's ability to make decisions. The first of those is that there needs to be some genuinely independent body um, that is responsible for, if not making, then advising on the calculations that underpin the system, whether it's the calculation of the quantum of the block grant, the calculation of the, qu of the amount of any reductions in the block grant by whatever mechanism you use, um, for in and I think also for then doing post facto audit um, to review what has gone on and see what, ha what has actually happened. It is remarkable how little anyone does that. Um, as I, I think I made, a, I, I referred in a footnote in my note to you to the only um, example of doing that that I'm aware of, which was undertaken by David Heald and Alistair um, uh, McLeod, published in 2005, based on data from, if memory serves, 2000 to 2003, um, for, for a very early spending review period post devolution. Only possible because. Uh, Professor Heald had access as, as a committee advisor to, docu to, to detailed quantitative information from Treasury that it was not normally published then, is not published now. There's no particular reason as far as I can see why it shouldn't be published, it just isn't. Um, and the forensic examination doesn't shows that actually there appears to be something of a black hole in how the numbers worked, even at a time when they were relatively straightforward. So this is, this is a material issue. Now, Institutional structure of that body, well, one could draw on the parallel of the Office of um, uh, um, uh, budget, uh, Budgetary Responsibility, the OBR. I prefer the example, and we've discussed this in some detail in our recent report from the Bingham Centre, which I've also referred you to, a constitutional crossroads. Um, in th there are many features of the, uh, the Australian system that I think are problematic, but the structure of the Commonwealth Grants Commission has proved to be a very effective and durable one. The CGC has been in being since the 1930s. It's composed of independent experts. They usually are mostly from public service backgrounds. They've worked for both state and uh, federal governments. Um, there's usually one or two ac academics on there. They are, by, they are very expressly not elected politicians. They have never been a, um, held any political office like that. So they're, 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 they are understood to be accepted as being politically impartial and they are able to do um, a job of work of advising the Commonwealth Treasurer about how the system works sufficiently effectively that the Treasurer has always accepted their advice. Um, he, has never tried, he or she has never tried to alter the, the, the recommendations that have come from the CGC. So institutionally that's attractive. Um, the second body I think we need is, is some better mechanism to deal with disputes and disagreements between governments. We, it, it, it becomes, I think, very difficult to have um, a UK government minister deciding about a dispute between a UK government department and a devolved administration. There needs to be something that, that can be genuinely impartial and that, if, that, that can impose some, some stronger sanction on the UK government um, than um, a, a very... A, well, the, 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 the practically non-existent consequences there are at the moment. At the very least, publishing a report that says the UK government is refusing to, 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 to act in a responsible manner here, if that were, it, were its finding. Um, so I think that that's where you would need to get to in institutional terms. I'm afraid I've forgotten the second part of the question. <laughs> I mean, basically, the, the, what I was asking you was about uh, 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 systems being um, uh, asked about the independent body to yes. that was all disputes, which you've touched on, and also asked you about uh, keeping systems under regular review yes. rather than believing systems yes. can be introduced. Yes. Uh, again, work. it's it's commonplace um, in in other in in federal systems that you are going to review these mechanisms periodically. 
Um, the Australians, being remarkably well organised, um, have a five-yearly review of the basic, basic framework that is used by the Commonwealth Grants Commission. So every five years, a fairly systematic root and branch review is carried out of the, the indicators that are used and what they should be. Um, and that is in the light of directions from the Commonwealth Treasurer about what the system should be seeking to achieve. So they are told what, they, what they, the system should achieve. They go away and work out how to achieve that. Um, other systems, for example, Canada, op would review less frequently. And you have three, three, four significant elements in how the Canadian system works. You have the Equalisation Fund. You have um, two transfers called the, what the uh, Canada Health Transfer and the Canada Social Transfer from federal government to the provinces. You have a separate mechanism that funds the, the three territories. Um, and you then got... Um, the tax capacity of, of the provinces themselves. And each of these is reviewed on a different cycle. Uh, but they are each reviewed. Equalisation, which is the largest of those transfer programmes, is reviewed about every seven to ten years. They're gearing up for another review now, I believe. OK. Thank you. Now, just sticking with yourself before I go, move on to David, uh, Professor Trench, you said uh, the mechanisms proposed by the UK government in the command paper Scotland and the United Kingdom and enduring settlement of significant shortcomings and are likely to rely on negotiations that will themselves be based on data of questionable accuracy. Uh, this system is unlikely to breed confidence, its fairness and unlikely to be stable. So I'm wondering if you can comment on that. And also, has the Treasury grasped the need for a transformation? Because uh, it's one thing for us to talk about, but do they believe that this has to take place? And can, um, and, and, and can improvements be implemented prior to um, Smith uh, being rolled out? Um, I think Treasury is starting to learn the, the, learn the nature of the, the situation that, that, that arises, um, and it is, a, it is a learning experience for them. Um, I, am, I don't think they are where they need to be yet, um, I am, I, but I'm not, I, I wouldn't say that that means they won't get there. Um, time to, I, whether they will get there in time, as you put it, for the, for the rollout of Smith, will depend on the timescale for that. Now, I understand that we're expecting a bill in today's Queen's speech, or to be announced in today's Queen's speech, to be published shortly thereafter, and likely to be passed um, probably before the end of the current um, session here. Um, so, during the, current West, during the Westminster parliamentary session that opens today. Um, that, I don't know what that means, though, in terms of applying those further powers in a Scottish context. Well, that will mean... Um, a year or two after the Scottish rate of income tax comes into effect next year, or poss I mean, one, one, the, the, long, the long ball option would of course be at, after the next Scottish Parliament elections. Um, I have no idea what, what the position is regarding that. The white paper doesn't tell us anything very useful about that. Um, we may learn more when the bill, when the bill is published. Um, so, can you remind me of the first part of your, your question? <laughs> okay. Yes, yeah, so it's basically, I was asked about transparency, how it could be yes, improved ahead uh, of Smith, and then you, you, I talked about, you, you said in your paper that the system is unlikely to breed confidence in its fairness, and unlikely to be stable. Indeed, yes. No, I, um, I, I'm not sure that I can say very much more than that, that that appears to me to be the case. As you will know, we have quite problematic data about tax receipts across the UK. Um, we also have um, Revenue and Customs struggling to identify Scottish taxpayers in order to make the, even the Scottish rate of income tax system work. That's not helpful because income taxes, of all the taxes we're talking about, one of the easiest to devolve. And a lot more work needs, I think, to go into understanding um, where, how we attribute the origin of taxes um, in a geographical sense. And that's necessary on both sides of this equation, not just to work out what... Scottish revenues are or might, might be, but also to understand what, as it were, they notionally would be in order to, uh, to assess how the, this, the first of the no detriment principles, uh, which Mr Phillips talked about, um, will actually operate. Um, if this is meant to be revenue neutral, um, we need to have better data in order to do better projections from that data than we do at the moment. And I think the first and foremost point to start with, with this is better data and more published data. We have, of course, reasonable data for Scotland. It is not perfect, but it's better than we have for anywhere else in the, in the form of the, of, of the JERS survey. 
um, we have rather dubious um, similarly calculated data for Northern Ireland. We don't have anything for Wales. Um, we have some very generalised figures for the UK as a whole, and we have an experimental, some, some experimental data uh, from HMRC. And we've got to do much more work, I think, to make that, um, that all useful. Thank you. Uh, David, on the same kind of area, um, uh, you talk about the need to ensure transparency and effective scrutiny and uh, uh, such information, for, uh, for example, on the uh, um, uh, scrutiny of the block grant and Barnett formula uh, mm -hmm. should be published in full every fiscal event which affects the devolved government's block grants. Yes. So um, I tried to do a similar exercise to that, that paper you mentioned from 2005 um, just recently. So... Um, the, um, uh, one of the issues that, uh, that Professor Trench was touching upon uh, in, in an earlier answer was the fact that whilst the principles of how the uh, Barnett formula work um, are uh, published, uh, and there's quite a lot of detail about how the individual department's budgets and investments should feed into the Barnett formula, um, they don't actually publish information on the calculations that actually get made at the time of the spending review or at the time of each budget. And there's complicated things about uh, how baselines change between different periods. And it, it's, it's the actual implementation of it is quite opaque and uh, information is not published. Um, now, the House of Lords Committee on the Barnett Formula recommended that was published um, uh, back in 2009. It hasn't been acted upon. Um, I uh, managed uh, to uh, pester the Treasury and, and get hold of the spreadsheets that they use to do the calculations. Um, but you shouldn't have to do that. These are, these are spreadsheets that should be made publicly available so that the, uh, the, the work can be uh, critiqued and analysed and people can actually understand uh, what the budget allocation is for Scotland and, and for Wales and Northern Ireland. So I think, as I say in, in, in the answer to it, I think it was uh, question uh, three, I think that the, the, the Treasury or this independent body, if they take over this role, should, should publish this information so it's available there for, for public scrutiny and parliamentary scrutiny, both by by Westminster and by the by the devolved governments, um, because you know it's uh, the, the Barnett formula is is not just a principle; it's actually it's, it's 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 an operational thing as well. And a lot of the decisions uh, and are about what specific things are counted towards the Barnett formula. Do they decide whether to count the Olympics towards the Barnett formula, Kew Gardens, or these various things? And actually seeing how all these things get get counted into it and being able to replicate the figures, assess them, I think is important for transparency and it's important to um, uh, maintain the integrity of the system. Uh, might I just come in on that? Um, it's not, I, I was advisor to the, uh, the Lord's Committee on the Barnett Formula um, and it's not quite correct to say that the, 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 the changes are not published. They have been subsequently. It was, it's, it's one of those things that the UK government has done without formally announcing it's done. Mm -hmm. And it puts them in some very odd places. I forget when I found them for Scotland, but they are now, what they publish each year are figures for changes that have been made in relation to the baseline or when there has been something that triggers a consequential. And so there's a little addendum published each year that says this. For I happen to follow this for Wales rather more closely than I do for Scotland. For Wales, these are slightly oddly published in the Wales Office Annual Report, mm -hmm. even though it's quite hard to work out what it particularly has to it's, do with the Wales Office. That is where the information it, is published. It is, although the only issue there is that it doesn't actually break down the calculations it's, into their individual subcomponents. It just gives a total it's, it's amount very, it's, for the... Indeed. No, it's very broad brush, but it's more than we ever had before. Yeah. Okay, I just, just want to touch on one other area because I want to uh, allow colleagues uh, to come in here. And that's on the issue of borrowing. And um, mm -hmm. interestingly, you both get a different view on that, which is always interesting for the committee. David, yeah, you've talked about, uh, um, well, for local government borrowing, there are effective means for central government to deal with any problems uh, that may arise uh, if a particular authority borrows what's felt to be an imprudent amount. And you go on to say that the Scottish and UK governments should agree a limit on capital borrowing powers. Uh, whereas you, uh, Professor Trench, um, you, you say that Scotland and the United Kingdom in particular suggests a highly constrained approach, uh, most notably in paragraph 2.2.6, and you go on to say that borrowing choice is a zero-sum game in which devolved decisions count against UK ones is an inappropriate way to ensure fiscal devolution works. So, first of all, David. Okay. Um, so, uh, I was uh, asking this question on the, on, on the borrowing powers uh, with uh, the um, ideas of SIPFA in mind. 
So SIPFA um, have uh, submitted a, a um, in, their, in their submission, the idea that Scotland uh, should move towards a system of prudential borrowing for capital borrowing powers in a, s a manner similar to, to local authority borrowing. Uh, and they argue that it, it works well for local authorities. You haven't seen local authorities get into trouble. Um, and, um, you know, why not give the Scottish government these... Um, uh, a similar regime of, of, of borrowing, where the Scottish government just you know, kind of... Um, uh, what a prudential borrowing regime is, effectively, is that the Scottish government determines its own um, uh, limits of borrowing uh, subject to affordability and, and uh, the, the amount borrowed you know, being used only for capital expenditure, not for borrowing current expenditure on, on this basis. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, an, an overall prudential regime. Um, now... I'm not saying that I think this is uh, definitely a, the wrong approach. What I was saying is that I think there are potentially some differences in the politics between um, how things work at the local authority level and how they would work uh, for the Scottish uh, government uh, level. Um, so, in particular, uh, I think that you know, the reason this works well at the local authority level is, is, is twofold. Um, firstly, um, there's... There's the, there's the political power, in effect, for, this, for, the, for the UK government in, in England or the Scottish government in Scotland to intervene uh, if it thinks that the, the local authorities are um, uh, borrowing imprudently, that they, even though they've got this regime that, they are, that they're not acting prudently in their borrowing. Um, it, could, it could cap borrowing powers, it could intervene, it could send in commissioners, it could, it could effectively take control back of those borrowing powers. Um, now, in principle, you could have a regime like that for, for Scotland uh, in the UK, but I think the political ramifications of that would be uh, substantially uh, d different than they would be at the local government level. I, th I think it would, be, um, it would cause a constitutional uh, crisis if the UK government granted this prudential borrowing power and then at some point in the future took it back off Scotland. Um, assuming that Scotland would get into some kind of bother? In, in, uh, indeed. I, I, I'm not saying they uh, would, but no, there's, a, there's, you know. there's a potential. I guess, um, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a potential for it, and, um, you know, given the political situation, um, they, you know, there may not be goodwill on, both, on, on either side in order for their system to necessarily work. Um, there's a risk of that, at least, uh, in, in my view. Um, Secondly, the other, the other issue is a, a bailout. I think, you know, if, if local authorities get into trouble and they do need to be bailed out, well, one, uh, you know, uh, actually, if, if, if they were to fail, they're relatively small, but I think more likely they'd be bailed out, and the, the politics of bailing out would be people would grumble, people wouldn't like it, but uh, people, in, people in Glasgow would uh, bail out people in Edinburgh, maybe. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Um, but I think the politics of a bailout between the UK government and the Scottish government after uh, fiscal autonomy or after you know, further devolution would, would be, again, of a different order of magnitude. So I'm not saying I think the prudential borrowing regime um, is, is a non-starter, but I'm saying that I think the, the political issues in it are quite different uh, to the issues that uh, arise with prudential borrowing at a local authority level and that those would need to be really considered by, by both the Scottish and the UK governments before going down that route. If those risks are seen as being too high, um, then a, a regime with an expanded amount of capital borrowing powers, you know, with a, with a limit, um, might be uh, a more workable approach that, that doesn't have those, those political problems because, you, you know, you, you have in advance what the limit is, so you haven't got the potential for grievance later on. Mm, it just seems to me your, your approach is a wholly negative one, and it does seem odd that you know that a government in Edinburgh would have less powers than the local authorities over which it has uh, significant powers itself, but in borrowing, it's, it, it, you know, we would have fewer powers than councils. I mean, I think that's a pretty illogical place to actually be, um, don't you think? Um, it, I agree that, um, you know, if you look at it, you know, at the, the levels of the government and you say, oh, which, which, which level is the higher level and it has less, pow less powers than the, than the lower level of government, taking that on its own... You might, you might come to that conclusion. However, I think what I was, what I was raising in my, my submission was the fact that you know, there are different political risks in this, in, in, in this context. So 
you know, it's, it's, it's not just a question of the, of the level of government, it's a question of, you know, actually, given the political situation, given the, the institutional arrangements, um, you know, is the same, um, is, is the same mechanism appropriate? Um, I'm not saying it's uh, a prudential borrowing regime would not be uh, the right answer. I'm saying that there are, there, there are um, uh, political issues which mean that it may not be uh, the right answer, even though it works well for a lower level of government. Okay. Um, Alan. Um, thank you, Kavina. I have to say, I, I don't have any... I, I, I find it quite hard to find any objection to the idea that... Um, that, 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 that the Scottish government should have a power for prudential borrowing. Like, that doesn't particularly uh, concern me at all. I think much greater issues arise as a result of the other of, of the more serious borrowing power that's necessarily implicit in fiscal devolution, and that is there has to be a power to borrow to deal with the, 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 the volatility implications of that. And if one looks at the figures, that the amounts that you borrow in those circumstances are much greater than you're likely to be borrowing. Um, certainly in any year or any five-year period, under any prudential power. Um, that's that's the, the point at which things can start to um, become difficult uh, because you're talking about, you can be talking about very substantial amounts of money, you can be talking about running fiscal deficits, you are talking about substantial costs by way of debt service, and you have to address from the outset the question of bailout. Um, you have to work out who is the lender of last resort in relation to this. Now, again, there are experiences around the world. Um, there are some countries that have very constrained borrowing powers for sub-state governments, in some cases because sub-state governments have, um, have, have gone bust in the past, and the result has been to constrain their borrowing uh, thereafter very considerably. Um, by contrast, there are governments that operate with practically no constraints whatever. Canada is, um, I always find, an intriguing one. Um, where the provincial governments go off and borrow very substantial amounts of money on the capital markets on their own by issuing their own bonds, um, there is no guarantee whatever of a bailout from the federal government, and the markets appear to believe that. Um, there are cases where they do not believe that, and they believe that there would be a bailout from the federal government, which in effect reduces the risk premium that um, the, the sub-state governments would pay on their interest charge. Um, and equally, the Canadian provinces have quite a widespread of risk premium of, of interest rates and risk premium. Even though I don't believe anyone has any has has ever defaulted, certainly since, uh, since Newfoundland entered Confederation. Newfoundland is, it has to be said, an example, not as a province of Canada, when it was an, an independent dominion, of, of over-borrowing and going bust, going bust as a result. And that is, that's a story that results in um, Newfoundland ultimately becoming part of Canada. Um, and in, certainly in federal countries, and it's not a risk, I think, that presents itself in the UK context, this can affect federal-level public finances as well. This has affected Brazil's public finances. When the, richer province, when the richer states of Brazil went off and borrowed a great deal, were, were unable to pay back, they had to be bailed out by the federal government. Um, the result was to have, need to reconstruct the whole borrowing regime in Brazil um, because this was affecting... The, the credit worthiness and the, of, of Brazil and the exchange rate of its currency. Now, that's a cut in, in the context of, the large, of the, some of the largest as well as most prosperous states of a pretty large country. In relation to Scotland, the risk from a UK point of view, I think, has to be different because um, Scotland is, 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 is less than 10% of the population of the UK as a whole. Um, the issue, rather, I think, then becomes also one of UK-wide equity that um, what, what a system can't, as it were, grant Scotland free money um, simply because Scotland wants it if that causes disadvantage to the rest of the UK. Um, e uh, and finding the way through that is, I think, the difficult part. What is the, the, the answer then? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, well, I, I, I hesitate to, to offer an advanced answer. Um, I'm sure that you have been, you, you and your advisors have been following the work of Angus Armstrong of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, who's been considering this question in some detail, um, and who is strongly of the view that there needs to be an extensive borrowing power with the scope to go bust. I disagree with, 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 with Dr. Armstrong because um, I think that there is 
sufficient risk for the UK government in this that it cannot simply say there will be no bailout of Scotland. Scotland can go off and borrow freely, but it's at its own risk, without there being um, a, and at least a, a, an implicit assumption in the markets that there would be some bailout if it were to go wrong. And my own view at the moment, and it's, it's, it's not a particularly carefully researched one, is that the, the, the best way through this thicket is probably for there to be some sort of ceiling, how you calculate that, I don't know, up to which the UK government expressly agrees to indemnify Scottish bonds. And it expressly says it will not indemnify any borrowing above that ceiling. So if Scotland wants to go off and borrow beyond that amount, it will very clearly do so at its own risk. Um, and I think that is about the best way of balancing the, the various considerations that are involved. Okay, do you want to make a final point before we move on then? Yes, I would say on the um, uh, current borrowing powers, I think there is uh, a real need for Scotland to, to have further current borrowing powers to, to smooth, as, as Alan says, the, um, the uh, cyclical volatility. Now, to some extent, um, depending on what block grant adjustment mechanism is used, some of that um, uh, volatility will be taken up by the block grant mechanism. That's the whole point about you know, the, the index method of, of Haltham uh, insulating Scotland from the kind of the aggregate cyclical risk. But there still will be idiosyncratic Scotland-only cyclical risk, um, which could actually be quite substantial, you know, the, the, the more taxes that are devolved to Scotland. Uh, at the moment, under the, under the Scotland Act, um, the, the current borrowing can only be used to, to borrow for forecast errors. But actually, you know, you might forecast a recession and be able to need to borrow for that. So I think there is... Uh, a, a need for substantially uh, larger powers on the, on the, on the current side. Um, so that is one area where I think, you know, we need to go much further than, than, than is there at the moment. Um, and, you know, there, there was an indication of that in the, the command paper that they were kind of, you know, pushing, pushing down that, that road. And I think there is, there is a need for, for substantial more uh, borrowing on the current side. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to open out the session now. And the first person to ask questions will be Malcolm, to be followed by Joan. Just briefly on, on the block grant adjustment, I, yeah, David Phillips, your, your, op your scenarios there were useful. I, I, I mean, I, my sense is from listening to different people that the percentage uh, change in UK tax revenues is, is the one that's commanding the most support. So I, I would imagine that's the one that's, that's going to happen. But I, I mean, I, I may be missing something here, but you said Scotland would benefit from tax increases in the rest of the UK. But I mean, does that not work in two ways? That, I mean, is that the assumption that they would get more through the... The, the consequentials, Barnet, or but, but surely that would that would increase the tax taken in the rest of the UK and therefore increase the amount taken off the block grant now. So um, yes, and the the, the uh, scenarios they are talking about where Scotland would benefit from um, spending in the rest of the UK. So I'll I'll, I'll give you a, a simple example which which kind of shows that. Um, so let's suppose that uh, in the rest of the UK they put up. Uh, income tax uh, by two pence in the pound. Um, that raises about ten billion pounds in the rest of the UK. That's about eight percent of income tax uh, revenues in Scotland. That's uh, eight percent of income tax revenues in the rest of the UK. So the percentage indexation method would say, well, income tax revenues in the rest of the UK are going up by eight percent. We're now going to take eight percent more off the Scottish block grant. Um, to account for that. Now, 8% of Scottish income tax revenues will be about, I don't know, 10 and a half, uh, sorry, 10 and a half billion, about, about um, 850 million pounds. Um, so you take an additional 850 million pounds off the block grant. Now, under the Barnett formula, a 10 billion increase in spend, if, if that money, addition of revenue was spent in the rest of the UK, 10 billion pounds uh, would lead to about a billion pounds uh, to the Barnet formula for Scotland. So you've taken £850 million pound off the block grant for the higher revenues in the rest of the UK, and then Scotland gets a billion pounds to the Barnet formula. So Scotland gains about £150 million pounds from a tax change that hasn't affected Scotland, that's only affected England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And it's because the Barnet formula works on a, per, a pound per person basis, and the percentage method of, of, of indexation is, is percentage. And the pounds and percentage don't necessarily line up because 
a given percentage increase in revenues in Scotland is not the same pounds per person increase uh, as in the rest of the UK. So um, th there could be, you know, Scotland gaining a bit from tax increases in the rest of the UK, Scotland losing a bit from tax decreases in the rest of the UK. Now, the reason why I, um, I come to the kind of... Um, uh, on, the reason why I, I think that, if it's, for, for, from Scotland's sake, that um, this, this would be okay is that these things will balance out over time. You know, income tax, taxes will sometimes go up in the rest of the UK, sometimes go down in the rest of the UK. These things should balance out over time. Um, but, um, yeah, there can be some small knock-on effects from individual tax changes in the rest of the UK, just because um, the interaction of the Barnet formula with the, the block grant... Uh, but that, but that's assuming all the tax increases spent on devolved. Devolved, yes. Yeah. If it doesn't go on devolved oh. spending, you, you get into an interesting situation. Uh, I'm going to um, have a slightly different perspective on this than, than one of the people that give evidence at the, the committee. So if they spent that money on something that was non-devolved, say they spent it on defence, you wouldn't have any additional money thrown, flowing through to the Scottish government, but you would still have this... £850 million pounds taken off the block grant. Now, some people have suggested that that is unfair, um, that um, you've, you've had a tax change uh, in, in the rest of the UK um, to fund some, some non-devolved spending, um, and that's caused a reduction in, in the Scottish Government's budget, which means either cutting spending in Scotland or having to increase Scotland's own income tax to make up the difference, uh, and, and that's unfair. I think in the context of a system where there is still reserved non-devolved matters, it isn't unfair. That is the way the system um, kind of has to work for fairness uh, to be in place. Because if Scots are um, uh, benefiting from spending that's been done at the UK level, um, whether that's defence spending or whether that's uh, state pension spending or foreign affairs spending or, 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 or payments for the national, uh, existing national debt... Um, Scots, uh, it, it, fairness requires that Scots, as well as those in the rest of the UK, contribute uh, to, to that spending. Now, in the first instance, that's by cutting the Scottish Government's block grant. Um, in the second instance, if the Scottish Government wants to make up for that, it can also increase its income tax, just as in, same as in the rest of the UK. So, um, my perspective is that you know, like, it's a bit different to someone else's okay, well, evidence. We, we could make lots of comments on that, but at least it's very clear that was a very helpful explanation of that. Now, moving on to the Barnett formula, you, like uh, most intellectuals, want to uh, change it or get rid of it, and uh, I suppose a lot of backbench MPs do as well. I mean, I suppose my own sense is it's very significant that none of the front benches in the House of Commons do because they understand the politics of it, but I suppose what I want to pursue here is whether, it, whether you actually need to do that or whether, in fact, under the new regime, it will, in fact operate as it's supposed to operate in terms of convergence because the main reason it's not converged as far as I understand is because of uh, the, uh, the rest of the UK population growing faster than the Scottish population but under the new regime oh, uh, Professor Trench is shaking his head so he'll explain that but under the new regime if the rest of the uh, UK's population grows faster than the Scottish population we will lose out in terms of the block grant adjustment because their tax revenues will increase uh, at a higher percentage than ours. So, in fact, will the new regime of block grant adjustment actually make the Barnett formula uh, work more as it's supposed to in terms of convergence, and therefore there won't be any need to kind of get rid of it as you're proposing? So, um, there's a, to some extent, it depends on what ways, what, what indexation method is used to index the block grant uh, reductions for the tax devolution. So in order of, um, you know, which will lead to the Barnet squeeze taking place more quickly, the first one is if you were to index it, um, not, to, not in percentage terms, but index it in pounds per person terms, uh, that would lead to the, to the kind of faster squeeze, uh, as Professor uh, David Bell uh, showed in his analysis. And that would lead, you know, because a given pounds per person increase, um, um, a given percentage increase in revenues in the rest of the UK is more in pounds per person terms than in Scotland. So if you index it in pounds per person, you know, Scotland would have to grow faster just to keep up with uh, the rest of the UK. So you know, you, the, the squeeze would definitely take place under a pounds per person indexation. 
And with the percentage indexation, the one, the one that I talk about mostly, you would still, you're right, you would still see um, a, um, it, it, if the Scottish population grew less quickly and the growth in revenues per person um, in percentage terms was the same, that would also lead to a, kind of the squeeze uh, increase in value to today. Finally, if you were to increase uh, the, the block grant reductions, not in percentage terms, but in percentage per person terms, um, that wouldn't lead to any squeeze at all because you'd be counteracting uh, the population effects there. So it, it, it depends on the precise indexation method used to adjust the block uh, grant over time. Um, but you're right, under the method um, that I discuss, um, that, that squeeze would take place. Now, I think differential population change is one of the reasons that is uh, affecting uh, why the, the, the Barnett squeeze hasn't happened so much. In recent years, it's also because the squeeze doesn't take place when, when um, spending's being cut. It only takes place when spending's been increased. Um, but I think there have been some other uh, factors going on in the background as well that have, have meant that the squeeze hasn't taken place. Um, one of the big factors, actually, was the devolution of uh, rail spending in 2006-07, because uh, Scotland went up from getting about 3% of rail spending to 8% of rail spending overnight. Um, so spending jumped in those years. Um, I think you know, there's some other changes as well. You know, by, formula bypass uh, happens as well, where top-ups get made to the devolved governments. Um, you shaking your head, Professor French. Yes. Um, um, let, let, me, let me just try and address the, the convergence issues. Um, I'm... The arithmetic and the structure of the Barnett formula means that there should have been really very dramatic convergence um, on, during the, particularly during the huge public spending boom of the early noughties. So roughly 1999, 2000 to about 2007, 2008. And it didn't happen. And it should have done, but it didn't. Part of the reason, and I, I'm, I may be um, the rail spending point that, that Mr Phillips mentions, I'm not sure about that. I'm very dubious about formula bypass because there's very little evidence that formula bypass was going on at that time. And indeed, formula bypass is something that has become very hard to achieve and very open when it does because there are decisions made about what, what is and with, within and out with the block grant. What I think is material during that period is what was happening to Scotland's population, not what was happening to the UK's population as a whole, but what was happening to Scotland's population. It was, for, for most of that period, it was still falling at really quite a dramatic rate, 0.3% per year or thereabouts, I believe. And what that means, because, of course, due, since 1997... Uh, since 1999, we have rebased the numbers for, used for the Barnett formula every three years through the spending review process, which had not been happening regularly before then. Um, and that's part of the reason why convergence did not happen through the 80s and the 90s. Um, but it would appear that even during that, those short spending review periods, the rate of population decline in Scotland was sufficient to cancel out the convergence effect when you look at spending on a per capita basis. So it, the population factors become really very important here and the accuracy of those. And it's worth noting that the, the, the ONS figures for population change for the next 15, 20 years suggest a much slower rate of population decline in Scotland, something like 0.1% per year. That means actually convergence should start to happen. So that... Um, do you want me to talk about a little bit about Barnet as well? No, well, well, that's an, no, well, that was the point I was raising. So, I mean, I think you're agreeing with me, actually. So, the, there will be more convergence. Oh, I, I think that's very likely. Oh, um, when you talk about you, what I was going to say, what I, you, you, you addressed Mr. Phillips' question of, of, of people wanting to, to get rid of the Barnet formula. Yes, and, and was I, that, I have was that to provocative. Was that, I thought, well, indeed. Well, I have to be admit to being a member of that club as well. Um, and, and indeed, we very, we, we, we very explicitly say that in the recent Bingham Centre report. Part of the reason for that, we, we, when we were drafting that, we did consider whether how to put what, those recommendations, and we thought, well, th there was actually very little point in not saying get rid of the Barnett formula, because what we were proposing amounted to doing that. We could have said... We could have not talked about getting rid of the Barnett formula, which would not have, which would not have got us a headline. Um, but... It, it would actually have been misleading. If you think about what the Barnett formula is, we use the term the Barnett formula really to cover three things. One is the quantum of money that's, that's paid to devolved governments every year from Treasury. The second is 
the, is the formula itself, the, 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 the means by which we calculate that amount. And the third is the administrative machinery that goes with it, and the fact that Treasury retains so much authority in relation to all decisions regarding it. And as I was saying in my, my answers to the convener earlier, once you've started to, to take apart and reconstruct the administrative machinery, once you've started to do the sort of fairly systematic review you need to do of the formula and how you calculate the numbers, um, you're, you're ultimately going to have an effect on the quantum anyway. The quantum is not the target here. But once you've taken apart the two things that lead to the quantum, you might as well say we're getting rid of it. Because it's, it is what, what you would end up with would have certain characteristics, I suspect, in common with the Barnett formula now. I can't see any way that you can reconstruct the grant element of funding without using England as your reference point, which is what the Barnett formula does. Because you get a consequential share of changes that are made in spending for England. Um, and it's inevitable that that's going to have to be your reference point because there is no other reference point that's suitable to use. But with, with that exception, I think that you are, you, you're going to end up with something that's so changed that, that even posthumously it would be um, uh, a favour to, to Lord Barnett to take his name off a formula he's long been seeking to disown. Okay, well, I could pursue that, but, 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 but I just want to ask one more brief question, and I haven't really I got time to pursue that. Uh, and this is really about David Phillips' update, which is, of course, is very topical and very interesting. And if I can just ask briefly about uh, national insurance contributions, because you, you make two statements which appear to be contradictory, because on the one hand, you say, well, it's just another income tax on, on earned income, and you refer to Merleys, and we know that Merleys wants to merge those two. Mm -hmm. But then you go on to say... Oh, well, no, the, 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 um, who, who would pay for the pensions of people who had worked in England and retired to Scotland? And I don't really understand why you asked that question, because okay. I don't think the SNP are proposing that pensions should be paid any way differently than they are at present uh, under the devolution of national insurance contributions, unless I misunderstand their position. Uh, no, so um, my initial reading of the... Um, of the manifesto suggested that they were looking for the devolution not only of national insurance but also potentially of, of welfare in its entirety as well. Um, so that that's why the the, the, right. the point why I, I raised that. Also, you know, um, I completely agree with with you, and and you know, it's, it's a long-standing position of, of many uh, uh, researchers at IFS that you know, uh, national insurance is just another income tax. But uh, the UK government ma maintains the pretense that it's a social security. Uh, contribution. So there are these notional links between um, uh, uh, NI contributions and, and benefits received. So they, you know, we, we, I mentioned this part about you know who would pay these these pensions because you know if you did go to this full devolution of of, of NICs and welfare, there would be these questions that you know are they at least notionally you know the, 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 these questions would need to be answered. I think the answer would be that the pensions get paid by you know. The government where the, the pensioners live, and there's some adjustment to the, to the, to the block grant that accounts for pensioner population. Um, but there would be some technical issues involved, given the, um, the, 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 the kind of pretense we have of a contributory system in this country. But is the general view of the Institute of Fiscal Studies in support of the Merley's position that really we should just get rid yeah, of it? Yeah. Because at the present, um, there still is a fund, but it's not clear to me what the, the purpose The fund is fund. notional. It's, it, it, uh, it doesn't really, um, you know, link in any way to what actually gets paid out in benefits. Um, it, it, it's is it notional? Or does it still, because you still hear about so much is coming from the fund and so much is coming from general taxation. But you do, but it... it, it Unless something is actually completely separate, it's just uh, what we call dodgy hypothecation. It doesn't matter where the money comes from because you, you, just, you just pay whatever it comes. So whatever you label it as, it, I mean, it, it doesn't it, really matter. The intricacies of the National Insurance Fund are something that I don't think I would ever recommend anyone to get their heads around, but are quite bizarre because the fund both is underwritten by general taxation, by the consolidated fund, so any shortfall gets made up from general taxation. But the fund is then used to pay not only benefits like pensions, so but also pensions. a variety of other bizarre charges, including, as, as, um, including an element of funding for the NHS. Um, it, is, it is a system that, that has badly needed re reconstruction for a long time, but no one has done anything to it since, I think, mm -hmm. 1975. Um, and in essence, it's, it's a system that was put in place in 1948. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's still our view that, you know, these, these systems should be merged. And actually, by um, the system, the, kind of the devolution settlement as it stands, well, you know, having, having income tax devolved and, and national insurance not devolved, 
kind of stops that happening. Actually, devolving NICs as well could give you a situation where either Scotland on its own or, or the rest of the UK on its own or, or both could, could seek to merge those, you know, notwithstanding the political difficulties of, you know, actually making people realise how much uh, tax they're paying. OK, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Yes, John, to be followed by Mark. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, yeah, probably to touch on some of the areas that we've touched on already, um, including uh, Barnet. Um, Professor Trench, you, you talk about um, a more rationally constructed grant, which I assume means less than we're getting at the moment. <laughs> and uh, Mr Phillips, you also say um, such a system would be fairer than the existing system, which involves block grant that has no relation to current needs. So again, I assume that means we'd get less. Is, is that in fact the case? Um, so, uh, I haven't done a needs assessment uh, myself, so I, I wouldn't want to uh, come to any firm conclusions on that. Uh, I would, uh, you know, I, I would have to recognise that the most recent needs assessment, and I, I think it was a good piece of work, Jerry Halfman's work uh, in Wales, uh, did suggest uh, that Scotland was uh, uh, receiving uh, more funding uh, than it would if it was uh, getting... Um, uh, the amount equivalent to what it would need relative to, to England. Uh, that's not saying the absolute amount. You could, you could argue, what, argue what the absolute amount should be, but the relative amount compared to England, uh, Jerry Holton's work suggested was, um, uh, was, was higher than it would need to be. Uh, Scotland does stand out, you know, being you know, relatively well off in terms of uh, income per capita um, and, and, and yet having, you know, very high spending. Um, but I mean, surely, while needs is part of the equation, the, the other part of the equation would be, well, that a no vote was meant to make sure we weren't any worse off, so there's a kind of commitment there. And this idea that, you know, we need compensation because we've given up sovereignty. So are, the, are these not factors as well? Um, so I think on the politics side, you're right. If, if, if um, you know, it, fundamentally, you know, um, there, there is... There is the question about, you know, what form of uh, equalisation and fiscal redistribution should, 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 take, should, take, to, uh, should take place um, in, in a fiscal union. Now, there are various ways you can look at that. You can look at a needs basis. You can look at a, a revenue equalisation basis, which is not equalising on, on needs, just on the revenues capacity side. You can look at a kind of a contributions-based basis. You know, how much are they, they paying in is, is what they get out. Um, so there are a whole range of options there. On, on the political issue about, you know, um, uh, the, the, you know, whether a commitment's been made or not to the Scottish people to, to keep the Barnet formula, um, that seems to be the position of the Scottish government and actually of the UK government at the moment, that the Barnet formula is there to stay. That's a political decision. Um, whether or not um, that decision is, 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 is fair and around, uh, I'll leave that to politicians, politicians to decide. Um, but the levels of spending in Scotland compared to uh, other parts of the UK do look, you know, on the most recent assessment, you know, not my own, Jerry Holtham's, do look to be relatively high. Mm -hmm. So on that basis, uh, moving towards a needs-based assessment would seem fairer on that. There is the question about how does that fit into the kind of political promises or mm -hmm. uh, uh, pledges that have been made of the Scottish people. I agree. Okay, thanks. Professor Trent, do you want to say anything on that? Um, yes. Um, I've already talked about... Um, the problems that are implicit in um, the present of Barnet arrangement, um, and, I, and I, would, I don't want to, re to repeat that, but I'm, all, that's, all that is relevant in this context. I think that's the first point. The second point um, is that a rationally constructed grant, I think, has to be, um, I and mean, we sketched out a, a, a way of doing this in the funding Devo more paper that I'm sure you've seen before, that we published in 2013. Um, and that, I think, is a much more would become a much more effective way of trying to manage devolution finance generally to combine the elements of grant and fiscal devolution. It's worth bearing in mind, additionally, this that under the Smith proposals, um, the tax taxes that flow directly to the Scottish Exchequer, both fully devolved taxes and the assigned share of VAT, would be equating for something, depending on how you cut the figures for the Scottish budget, between 50 and 60 percent of that budget of Scottish devolved spending. So the Barnett formula is only accounting for about half of that mm. now, um, or, or even a little bit less. And 
there is and there can be no objection whatever to, to higher levels of public spending in Scotland if Scottish taxpayers are paying for it. The question is how, is how much that, that any higher level of spending should be covered by taxpayers from out with Scotland. Was That's that not the promise that was made in the well, vow and so on? There, there is... A, there is, there is um, the, the, the promise that was made in the vow, so-called... Um, is to maintain the Barnet formula, but it's also subject to what became the Smith proposals for, for, for fiscal devolution. Well, was the implication not that Scotland wouldn't lose out, though? The, well, yeah, um, the Scot that's the implication. The, the problem with that, 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 with, with that, with that as an implication is that um, it's, an it's involving a, um, a set of um, assertions or assumptions about what is going to happen in the future which, by definition, you cannot guarantee, um, not least because of the behavioural effects of devolved taxation, which is the, what we've essentially been grappling about when we talk about no detriment. Um, the problem that you have, inevitably, is that devolved tax decisions may, indeed, if they are working, should shape the tax environment. Mm -hmm. um, they should shape your public revenues by whatever decisions they make. And the question is where also the responsibility for that lies. OK, thanks. Uh, if you want, yes. Huh? I should also add that, you know, that the, the Barnett formula, you know, if you move to a situation where uh, Scottish population is, you know, not growing less quickly than the rest of the UK, the Barnett formula does itself imply then the squeeze taking place. So in the, uh, the longer term, it's not necessarily the case that the Barnett formula itself would, would, would uh, be beneficial to Scotland. And in the longer term, a needs-based formula might actually deliver more um, than, than the Barnett formula if the squeeze... Um, does start coming to effect. effect. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. I mean, that's, certain, that's certainly true. I mean, the whole thing figure was that Scotland's relative needs come in at about 104, 105% of, um, of those of England. Scotland, the, the Barnet element of block grant funding is something in the order of about 118% of UK average. So on mm. the one hand, there is a very substantial degree of benefit to Scotland from that at the moment. Um, that is, I would have thought, a logical argument for, um, for, for, for the SNP actually to resist any call for fiscal devolution, whatever. Um, and I note that there's been, been, a, been a, a, a remarkable absence of that, of that demand. Um, the um, the sc Scottish... The convergence factor will take a long time to get down to that level, but ultimately it would, because convergence will drive Scotland down to 100% of English spending. Um, so... You would, that, that, is the, that would be where, where logically and ultimately convergence would take you. Right. Okay, right. I'd, li I'd like to move on to something else as well. Um, I mean, we've mentioned the whole concept of like an independent body to um, arbitrate between the two governments and if there was disputes mm -hmm. in a range of areas. But, I mean, and, and the example's been given of Australia, which is fine, but it, does it not work in Australia because you have a proper federal system and you have a written constitution, I think, um, whereas we don't. And, I mean, to have an independent body would be for the Treasury and Westminster to give up the ultimate control, and surely that's impossible for them. I don't see why. Um, I, I be think because devolution sure. fundamentally means they are graciously granting us a little bit of freedom. I, I, don't, believe that, my, my, I don't believe that's how devolution works, and I'm not sure that that, that sort of way of thinking about things is a particularly useful way of trying to understand the relationships that are emerging in these islands. So you think the actual f relationship will change? I'm, yeah. Uh -huh. I think, I think if, for the UK to work as a devolved union, it needs to. OK. I mean, on the... Because things like the budget... I mean, it would seem to me that to set the budget, the, the whole thing needs to change because... The bigger part, i.e. the UK, would set its budget first, and then the smaller part, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, would kind of tweak around the edges, whereas at the moment it's exactly the reverse. Uh, I, I mean, I would have hoped that Westminster might be willing to change that. Do, do you think there's any likelihood of them changing that? Yes. Good. OK. Right. Uh, do you want to say um, anything, Mr Phillips? Could, could, could I just yes? say <laughs> one, one small point? Um, when I talk about an independent body to deal with you, I, I, we, I was not... Um, I don't. I, I rather doubtful that the idea of arbitrating disputes is necessarily um, where the where this would need to need to go to. I think this is more likely to be a form of mediation than arbitration. Um, and 
that's not part of the Australian architecture, I ought to add. I mean, it, the need, it, it is said it is a measure of the success of the work of the, of the way that the Commonwealth Grants Commission does its job, that there has never been a need for that sort of dispute resolution mechanism. If there's a political dispute, it goes to um, their equivalent to the Joint Ministerial Committee, which is a body called COAG, the Council of Australian Government. Um, if there were a legal dispute, it would go to the courts. So effectively, it makes a decision and all sides so far have always accepted it? Yeah. Yes. Because it, does, it's, it's a, it's a, it is able to and in a position to do its job. And you think properly. we could get to that position here where... I think that has to be the aim. That has to be the aim, right. Okay. I, I agree that has to be the aim. I think, you know, the, again, politics is, is rather different here than it is in, in Australia. I think, you know, we'd have to be mindful of the fact that there's potentially, at least, um, a, uh, one of the parties um, not wanting to be part of the other... Kind of, one of the components not wanting to be part of the, the overall union. So that could have uh, an impact. The, the, the politics of that could have an impact on the operation of these systems. I'm not sure the way around that, but... You know, th th I think everyone has to be mindful of the fact that, you know, the, the, the political situation is not as stable a union as Australia. Okay, thanks. And the final point I just wanted to touch on was we, we've talked, and we've talked to previous witnesses about this, about the idea of, on the one hand, you've got the mechanical has been used, or I think automaticity came into one of your papers, um, whereby you set something up and it kind of works its way through and you can leave it to get on with it. On the other hand, you have a review and... And, and we negotiate, and some people have suggested we could negotiate every year, but that takes away virtually all of the mechanical side. Uh, I think we said five years for um, Australia and maybe seven years for Canada. Is there a right answer to that? I mean, partly I'd like to set up a system that would work for, say, 10 years, 15 years before we had to go back and look at it. I think you, if you could do something I th you, that, f that would work for as long as, as 10 or even 15 years, that would have many attractions, but I suspect that you would find yourself needing to do quite a lot of maintenance along the way. And I think you're, you're probably better off, as it were, going in for a regular service and, ha and knowing in advance that you have to go in for a regular service rather than, than, than having, a, um, having to go in periodically when things go, take, 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 as it were, this, this metaphorical car to its garage. Uh, period, rather more often because this bit's gone wrong or that bit's gone wrong and the windscreen wipers have fallen off or you suddenly need to replace the wheels or something. Yeah, OK, thanks. Uh, Mr Phillips, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I would uh, just say that I, I think that, you know, it, these, these two things shouldn't be seen as in conflict. You know, I think kind of the idea of something mechanical, working on a year-to-year -year basis, does have attractions to it. You know, that's why, you know, these, in, these, these methods of indexing along kind of Along the Haltham lines, where you deal with the tax changes directly, um, you know, and it, the interaction of the Barnett formula, you know, fall out directly. They do have their attractions. It avoids the year-to-year -year negotiations you, you would need. Um, you know, even on a year-to-year -year basis, it won't all be automatic, though. Particularly if you start invoking the no detriment principles for knock-on effects of policies. You know, the compensating transfers between the, 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 the different governments. But in as far as possible, year-to-year. I think there is benefits of it being mechanical, um, but I agree that you know it will need to be reviewed. I'm not sure if there's going to be an, an optimum duration. You know, I'm not sure politically whether it makes sense to have these reviews taking place in in non-election years to kind of maybe take up some politics for it, or whether that's just you know uh, hoping for too much. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> okay, Mark, followed by Gavin. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Kurt. We'll maybe touch a little bit further on the on the issue of the process and uh, around the budget because uh, uh, Professor Trent you were very confident in your your consideration that the Treasury's behaviours will will change and develop that's slightly out of step with some of the other evidence that the committee has received where the indication has been that the Treasury is unlikely to alter the way in which for example UK budget setting takes place I wonder what leads you to assume that 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 change is likely to take place because at the moment um, the you know what I've referred to as the rabbit out of the hat approach by the Chancellor uh, has, <laughs> has been there for quite some time uh, and and that that has become sort of behaviorally entrenched within UK Treasury budgets I, I think that's I, I, there are we have to I think we have to distinguish between the various elements of what Treasury does and how it does it um, and the, the, the central element of that, unquestionably, is the annual UK budget. 
and I think it's it's there's certainly a, a I, I think I, I'd, I'd agree with with people who say Treasury is not going to change that, certainly not going to change it very lightly, um, and that I, as I say I think that's probably right. I think in other respects Treasury needs to accept and recognise that that aspects of what it does have got to change because that is the logic of the situation. Um, and the, 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 political, the politics of it seem to me to be such that there is increasing awareness of that and will to address those questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, one of the areas which, which you've both spoken about is about the uh, more information around how the block grant operates. Um, and I think that there is a great deal of mystery that surrounds how, how it operates and, and more transparency is something that's been called for. Is there any reason why that couldn't happen in advance of the July budget, for example, um, as opposed to having to wait until the inaction of, of, of either the, the SRIT or the Smith powers? Um, the, I, don't, I, I think there, was, there would be practical difficulties in, in providing more information about how, how Barnet works. Um, not least because we need to specify much more clearly than, than, than I suspect we have, and I suspect that Mr Phillips and I both have ideas about what would be needed. But we would need to make sure that Treasury understood that and published it. Um, I think those are practical difficulties. Um, I don't think that in relation to this year's budget there's any particular reason why historic data couldn't be provided. I, I think they could publish the spreadsheets that they sent me. Um, you know, these, these spreadsheets exist on their hard drives. They're relatively easy to understand. Um, I'm not in a position to publish them <laughs> because I've got them, you know, uh, directly from them. But um, they sh they sh they can be published, um, and I can't see a, I, I can't see a reason why, you know, subject to you know uh, people agreeing to this, why they can't be published, you know, on the day of the budget along with the other uh, documentation. Hmm. Okay. Um, in in the IFS submission, um, it talks about. Uh, devolution of social security may result in a system better suited to Scotland's particular needs and preferences. We took evidence uh, last week from uh, Professor Michael Keating, who spoke of the tax and welfare mix in Quebec, um, so, and he said Quebec has been able to resist the tendency to greater social and economic inequality in the rest of Canada. Do you see that there is the opportunity, perhaps, for, for that same approach to be taken in a Scottish context following devolution of, of, of powers? I think I'd, I think I'd, I think I'd raise uh, two points there. Uh, firstly, that you know, uh, if there was substantial uh, further devolution of welfare powers, if there was you know uh, potentially say you know, devolution of NICs alongside income tax, that would give a, a much greater scope for policy variation. Um, you know, as I say, my you know, kind of my my update to my submission. Um, you know, it's not just about increasing or decreasing benefit rates; it's also about kind of completely restructuring the system. Um, so, in principle, there's, there's scope there to do things quite differently. You could have, subs you could have higher taxes and you could have uh, higher tax credits and benefits. Uh, you could you know, reshape the system to you know, redistribute more or less of people's life cycles. There's a whole range of things you could do. Um, however, you would be constrained by the extent to which uh, people's uh, behaviour responds. Um, both people you know, living within Scotland, uh, changing the amount they work, changing how much they report to the tax authorities, um, and also the migration response, people moving between uh, Scotland and, and the rest of the UK. You know, if there um, were um, substantially higher taxes at the top in Scotland, you might see people leave Scotland to, to, to live, in, live in the north of England or even move down to London if they were in the financial services industry. So I think whilst, um, whilst there would be scope for, for policy variation and you know, policy difference, the extent to which that, that could actually achieve drastic changes uh, would be affected by um, uh, mobility of, of people and behavioural response. I'm not sure of the specifics in Canada, but my impression is that you know, Quebec's economy has done somewhat less well uh, over the last you know, 30, 40 years than uh, in uh, the rest of Canada. I think there has been some movement of, you know, uh, of... The, uh, of of, of top earners and, and top businesses from Montreal to Toronto. Now, the extent to which that's because of d differences in tax regimes compared to the um, potential for secession, I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, differences in, in tax rates when they're large 
um, or differences in benefit systems when they're large can have behavioural responses. Okay. It's just because later on uh, in your submission, you also look at, um, for example, the, the SNP, Scottish Government, preference to increase carer allowance and other social security measures and say uh, none of these could be delivered by the Scottish Government under plans set out in draft legislation to implement the Smith Commission, which doesn't seem to tally with what, what, you've, what you've just been saying around use of, of tax powers and, and, and things like that. I just wonder um, where, where that... No, I, I don't think it does so. I think, um, I think this was in, in the... Where am I? I haven't got one, one with me at the moment. Um, so, if, it wasn't in one of my formal submissions. I think it was... If it was, was it on the, on the website, or was it, was it, was it something else I sent, sent over? Um, well, it says... I haven't got the page marked. I've pulled it out until we put in my questions. Oh, and it, it, it is in... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I've, I can see it, yep. Um, right, yes. Um, so, um, yeah, I can see that. So, yeah, under the Smith, under the Smith Commission proposals, um, you know, the Scottish Government will have the power to um, make changes to the systems um, in, in the devolved areas uh, of, of, of competency. Um, so, actually... Um, uh, with with some of these, um, uh, they could make the changes; others, they couldn't. So, actually, maybe maybe there was a, a, a small mistake there. So, on universal credit, you can't change the work allowances. On universal credit, um, halting the rollout of disability uh, 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 delay to PIPs. Now, most of that will will have been will have been done by the time that the powers under Smith are are there. Um, PIPs will be. Um, uh, will be one of the things that's devolved to the Scottish Government under the Smith Commission's powers. They will, at that stage, be able to undo those changes if they wanted to, but they won't be able to halt uh, the transition as it actually takes place. Um, forgive me um, uh, on this. Uh, I can't remember if carer's allowance is one of the ones that's being devolved. Yes, it, it is. is being devolved. Yeah, so actually, um, unfortunately, I, um, I made a mistake in this uh, document. Uh, admit that. So, um, yeah, so the universal credit they can't do, but uh, DLA and PIPs, uh, uh, they will be able to do once those are, um, uh, uh, once those powers are fully devolved to the Scottish Government. Um, what they won't be more generally able to do is increase other benefits. Uh, as we saw in the, 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 the draft clauses, um, the, the top up powers, which people initially thought would allow people to top up any benefit, seem to be restricted to top ups uh, for. Um, dis discretionary uh, payments. Um, also, they won't be able to make any 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 further uh, structural changes to the benefit system. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, what I was saying here is that you know further powers uh, for for devolution uh, would allow much 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 more in the way of um, uh, of changes to the benefit system. Um, there are some mistakes in that submission, unfortunately. Um, but you know there would be some powers under the Smith Commission. Okay. Just to um, touch on, obviously we're looking at the the fiscal framework that's going to be established. We've spoken a bit about the no detriment principle. I just wonder, from from your perspectives, uh, how much flexibility you see there being for there to be meaningful policy divergence, given that there are going there's going to be a, f a fiscal framework to be to be developed. But within that fiscal framework, there are going to be these mul the multiple no detriment uh, mm. elements, and how how constraining do you see them being in terms of the flexibility for for there to be real sort of policy divergence and taking a different economic approach? Well, I think it depends on um, you know uh, how much you know how seriously the no detriment principles are taken in terms of the the, the compensation elements of those. So uh, one of the things that's talked about in the no detriment principles is, you know, for instance, if the Scottish Government was to decide to, you know, have a more generous system of support for un unemployment, uh, you know, higher benefit rates for unemployed people, um, you know, one of the things that the Treasury have, have, have said that in that case, if, if the Scottish Government tops up unemployment benefit, people might stay on unemployment benefit for longer um, because uh, they, get, they get more income under it. That means that not only is the Scottish government paying more, but the UK government's paying more because um, the, the standard element of unemployment benefit and universal credit will remain um, 
part of part of the UK government. So that was one of the reasons why you know this, the UK government was concerned about top up payments under uh, um, under the, the kind of uh, the initial interpretation of the Smith uh, Commission um, uh, uh, powers of top ups. And they talked about the need for maybe compensating uh, packages. You know, the Scottish government has to pay the UK government for. Uh, the impact of, of those things. Similarly, there was you know, discussion about you know, if the Scottish version of the work programme was going to be uh, less effective than the UK version, would the Scottish government have to pay the UK government uh, for the additional benefit payments? So, I think... You know, Presumably there's a, there's a flip side to this as well, which is if, 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 if they're it's better. successful in Scotland and there's a compensatory yep. saving to DWP, does that simply get retained at the no, so UK the idea, level? No, the idea would be that these, these compensation payments would, would work in both directions. Now, uh, the, the issue here is that... I guess there are two ways you can think about this. One is that if, if these compensation payments have to be made and you know, people think these have to be made every single time there's potentially knock-on effects... Well, knock-on effects happen whenever there's policy differences, and calculating these uh, will be, be fraught with great difficulty. There'll be different assumptions used, different modelling used by the different sides. It'll be very hard to get agreement. So, you know, on the one hand, if this is taken seriously, and people say we need to have these compensation payments made in either direction, every time there's an effect, you know, it will become... Uh, incredibly difficult very quickly to, to actually calculate those, that could put a constraint on, you know, it, it could discourage policy differentiation. Um, on the other hand, if uh, there's, you know, an acceptance that actually, you know, the no detriment principles, you know, we, we, we can't apply this compensation in every single instance, um, that it has to be, you know, where there's, say, a particularly egregious example of a knock-on effect, um, you know, how you, how you agree on what these examples are is, is another question, but if it's seen as these, 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 these chances you know, being the exception rather than the rule, then you know, they won't have such, you know, such an influence and there could be more scope for, for policy, policy differentiation. Now, there will always be knock-on effects, but that is you know, part, of, you know, part, part of policy differentiation. You know, other countries, you know, the United States, for instance, you know, they don't have this no detriment principle in their, in their system, and they have great policy variation in income tax rates, in uh, corporation tax rates, sales tax rates, even even benefit rates across states. So, you know, whilst whilst behaviour response will impose some kind of uh, limits on on how far differentiation can go, um, you know, or at least you know give costs for giving differentiation uh, too great, um, the no detriment principles you know, may or may not have an impact depending on you know. Uh, whether or not they're invoked, you know, every time, or they're just used as, you know, only for very serious cases. Professor um, Briefly, yes. Um, I think I would agree with most of what of, of what Mr. Oates has said regarding no detriment and how it should work. Um, in relation to top-up powers, um, I, as the per as one of those responsible for first proposing this approach to allowing the Scottish Government to be able to top up and supplement welfare levels or introduce new benefits. Um, I do find it a matter for regret that, um, that the command paper and the draft clauses don't, in, don't go as far as they ought to in actually delivering that principle. It seems to me that's a, a very important element of how, um, as it were, a post-Smith world should work, and I, I, I do regret that that's not there. Um, I pr understand from, from the UK government point of view there are some serious practical difficulties, but I do not think that they've, they've been adequately addressed. Um, just to say something a about Quebec, um, I think Professor Keating may slightly exaggerate the extent to which Quebec has pursued a different um, social policy to, the, to, to other parts of Canada, um, to a degree. I mean, this may be a matter of nuance, and I'm not quite sure about what period he's talking about. I think that the one very important thing to bear in mind in a Quebec context is language. Um, not because it reinforces Quebec difference, but because it segments labour markets. And that means that um, mobility of labour is a very different business between Quebec and the rest of Canada compared to what it, what it is would be between Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, it is very much harder for people to move from Quebec to other parts of Canada because they need to have good English in order to do so, as well as a desire. Um, and, of course, that language hurdle does not exist in a Scottish context. OK. Um, finally, if I, if I may, Convener, just around intergovernmental 
relations and interactions. There's been um, evidence received by the committee that there needs to be a much more formalised process of intergovernmental relations than that which exists presently. Do you have any views on how that should operate? I, ha I have plenty of views. I'm never quite sure what formalised means. Um, um, and I'm very sceptical about things like statutory underpinnings because I'm not sure that they do any good and I'm not sure how well they would, would ever work. They seldom exist and very sel and even more rarely do any serve any real useful purpose in other parts of the world. Um, I think we need to be more systematic about this and we need much better information about this. And I think that the best people to get information out of ex the executives that conduct the most of these things are legislatures. And I would look particularly, therefore, at members of the Scottish Parliament um, to be trying to get more information about what's going on from Scottish ministers in the same way I would, would hope members of Parliament at Westminster would, would try and put uh, greater pressure on, uh, on UK government ministers to tell us what's going on. Because at the moment all we get is um, the, uh, the annual communique, the, uh, the annual report from the Joint Ministerial Committee, which is pretty terse and not very helpful. Mr. Phillips, do you take a view on that at all? Um, uh, I have nothing further to add on that on that point. I think I agree with most of what he said there. Okay. Thank you, Gavin, to be followed by Richard. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr. Phillips. You've uh, explained in your paper and uh, verbally here today quite a lot about how a block grant adjustment mechanism mm -hmm. that might work uh, in relation to devolved taxes. Um, can you say a little bit, because you touch on it in your paper, about how a block grant adjustment mechanism might work in relation to any uh, welfare elements that are devolved? Yes. So, in, at least in principle, it could work in exactly the same... Well, not, not exactly, but you know, a, a comparable way. So, what, the, you know, the, the simplest way to do it might be to say, let's take um, spending on uh, the comparable benefits uh, in the rest of the UK... Um, and index the block grant addition uh, to uh, what happens to spending on those benefits in, in the rest of the UK. Um, uh, that is kind of the analogue of, of what's happening on the, or, or what might happen on the, on the tax side. Um, now, I guess why that could be more complicated, um, I guess there's, 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 a, there's a couple of reasons. Um, you know, firstly... Um, there's uh, the fact that um, kind of structural changes to the benefit system uh, seem to, to happen more frequently than they do uh, to the tax system, um, at least to the income tax system. So, you know, um, whilst in principle, you know, you actually want these these changes, these, these block grant additions, um, to reflect actually what, what what's changed in the the UK system, because. You know, fundamentally, um, you know, there's this point you know, that Alan was making. You know, if Scotland wants to pay for it, higher welfare from its own tax revenues, fair enough. But if it's going to be funding higher welfare, um, should that come from the block grant? Um, so, you, in principle, you'd want um, to uh, have the system reflecting any you know, big reforms to the UK system. So, for instance, if they were to you know, DLA the PIP, cut the amount spent on disability benefits, you'd want to give the Scottish Government less money, and if they want to continue to, to pay more, pay for it themselves. Um, it's likely to lead to you know, more uh, political uh, difficulties on, along that line. Secondly, um, you know, many people have discussed you know, the need of, you know, given you know, the, the, the more rapid ageing of the Scottish population, if you'd have full you know, devolution of welfare, including pensions, would you want something to take into account um, the, you know, the known differences in demographics uh, that will affect Scotland. Um, you know, so you, you index it to the population age over the state pension age or you know, uh, make some adjustments there. So I think, you know, in principle, you can use the same, uh, the same methods as you do for the tax side, but because of the, the more frequent and, and, and large structural changes you see, you know, universal credit, PIPs, these things you've seen recently, and because, you know, there are some known demographic factors affecting... Uh, these things, there may be more scope for debate about should you take into account these additional things. So there could be more difficulties involved. Okay, if that may, I'm not sure that makes sense. It's yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I know what you're, what you're driving at. Um, I wonder if Professor Trench has any additional points on that um, subject. 
I'm afraid, as we, when we did the, the Devo Moral and Welfare work, this was one of the lurking problems that, that, that was, was, was in our minds. And um, it's a test that, it's something that we had ideas about, but nothing very clear. And I'm afraid that, that it's one of those cases where I think the, 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 the Scotland and the United Kingdom command paper badly flunks the test. Um, it, it's, it doesn't answer the problem. I think that the solution is going to be something like this, that you will identify appropriate proxies to identify a level of funding in relation to the devolved welfare benefits. As, and, and there would be an element of funding that would necessarily, I think, need to be in the AME element of the budget rather than the Dell element of the budget, but would flow into the block grant and be equally fungible with the rest of the block grant. Um, so you could spend it as, as it would be able to be spent as the Scottish Government saw fit. And your proxy might simply be as crude as to say, um, in 2016, 2018, whatever year we're talking about, Scotland accounted for X percentage of the UK recipients of benefit Y. And we will continue, we will assume that Scotland continues to have X X proportion of people who would be entitled to that benefit, subject to changes in the demography of Scotland, and pay and, and add an amount to the block grant on that basis. But I was disappointed that there was no serious analysis in the in, in the command paper of these problems, and it skated over these difficulties because that's what a come up, that's what a white paper should be doing. Mm. Okay, thank you, um, Professor Trench. Going back to one of your earlier comments, you talked about an independent body being required um, for the purposes of um, trying to predict uh, what, the, what the block grant ought to be, a kind of mm. post-event audit, mm. and also for resolving disputes. Do you... Not, it, not, if I may, uh, uh, not quite. Uh, I think we need two bodies, a different so, one to deal with, with disputes and disagreements. I guess that, that was going to be my question. I guess you, there's <laughs> right. three functions. Your, your view is the first two functions would be operated by one body and then the dispute. Yes, I, I think these, these, are, these are two things that are entirely different in okay. nature. We're talking about um, a specialist expert advisory body that's essentially carrying out a technical job and then a mechanism to resolve disagreements and disputes that I suspect is more in the nature of mediation than arbitration but needs to be able to do an element of both. It certainly could not, you certainly could not have your, your, your UK Finance Commission, let's give it that notional yeah. name, um, as the body that was also, go, that, that might well be the subject of the dispute, also involved in resolving them. That, that would simply offend sure. every principle of justice. So you would need some different mechanism. And as indeed we need for di addressing intergovernmental disputes more generally. Um, and that's what I think one, we're, we're driving out there. Sure. Okay, no, that's helpful. So, you, so the, fir the first body then, you basically said we could learn lessons from the, the Commonwealth Grants Commissions and give some helpful evidence on that. Is, is there, in terms of the a sort of dispute resolution body, is there an equivalent, I, mean, I think you said there isn't an equivalent body in Australia, is there an equivalent body elsewhere that we can draw lessons from that you've the, seen? There, there, well, there isn't, but I think the reason why there isn't is interesting and a comment on the difference between the UK and the nature of devolved government in the UK. Um, and that is, this comes back to a point that Mr Macdonald raised earlier, which is the unwritten nature of the Constitution. And in most, federal systems all have written constitutions. They, these tend to be rigid formal frameworks. They're difficult to amend if they can be amended at all. In reality, in many cases, they can't be. Um, and when there is a sufficiently entrenched disagreement that cannot be resolved by political means, um, by, well, I suppose now they're seldom smoke-filled rooms, but the, 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 <laughs> what used to be the proverbial smoke-filled smoke room, uh, then, then the, the matter will end up in the hands of the court, and the courts will end up providing, playing that role. Um, and... One example of this is Germany, where the principles, not the detail, but the principles of the German equalisation mechanism periodically get out of kilter, and on roughly a 12 to 15 year cycle, they get referred once again by the states that pay, the lender that pay most into, the, into this system, um, to the federal constitutional court. 
and the Federal Constitutional Court says the system has got out of work, does, ceases to work and apply its principles properly, and it needs to be reconstructed, and the states go away and they do a political deal, having been told to by the court. And this happens, this has now happened three times. So I'm fairly confident that it will in due course happen, in, happen a fourth. Mm. Um, I would like to see us not having to, n not using the courts in that way. I think that reflects both the failure of political government and it probably puts the courts in a very difficult position themselves because these are not issues that British courts are well equipped to resolve. They don't have the expertise. They're not accustomed to having that role. Maybe they'll become more accustomed to the role, but they certainly wouldn't have that level of financial and technical expertise. Um, and some alternative framework that puts an impartial body in place. I mean, when I say a body, I suspect one's sort of talking about, say, um, a group of three individuals would be the sort of mechanisms that we have in, that I have in mind. Okay. And the last issue, a question for both of you, but it, it was a comment that you said, uh, Professor Trench, in terms of borrowing, um, your view, I think, theoretically, was that there ought to be uh, some sort of ceiling below which uh, the UK government would indemnify. Um, uh, the Scottish government could go higher, but anything above that threshold would, would not be indemnified. Um, in terms of actual numbers, though, if, if, if we're talking about Smith powers and nothing mm. else, just for the, for the sake of the question, in terms of the Smith powers, do you have, a, do you have any sort of sense of view on what those uh, limits or what those uh, powers ought to be in actual monetary terms, or is that, have you not thought that quite I deeply? I, I, said it, I said that, I, uh, that this was not a particularly carefully researched sure, no, yeah. answer, and I'm afraid that's a question I have to duck. Sure, okay. And uh, Mr Phillips, I mean, do you have, uh, does the IFS have any kind of views um, on the, le the sort of level of borrowing that might be appropriate for the Smith powers? We haven't looked into the kind of numerical issue here. Sure. I think all I would say is that on the, on, the, on the current side, I think there would need to be a higher borrowing. I think it's 500 million at the moment on the, on the current side. I think that would need to be uh, higher. And um, I think there would need to be a, a lot more flexibility about how that's used, that much for sure. How much higher? That will depend on looking about just, you know, some kind of quantitative analysis about what kind of risk the Scottish government will be bearing with the package of powers either under the Smith or, and, you know, and then reassessed if, if additional powers had, had evolved to make sure that the, the amount of, of borrowing powers that are there give enough flexibility, give enough um, room for manoeuvre, given the amount of risk that would, the Scottish government would be bearing. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an exercise which involves, you know, not just picking them from kind of thin air, but actually looking at the kind of risks... Um, that the Scottish Government would face. Okay. Uh, do you, I mean, in, in terms of principle, do you, do you take the view that the, the limits should be comfortably higher than you would anticipate to actually need? Because presumably the last thing you want is to set a limit and then it turns out that mm. the limit was just um, off and you then have a situation where you need to, in fairly short order, extend it. Do you take the view that you should go slightly higher than you think you're likely to need or do you, do you kind of take a mid-level... Um, I haven't really had a chance to think about it in depth yet. I don't know if um, Alan has any... I would be inclined to think that, as it were, that, 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 that there would be every reason for a limit to be a generous one, yeah. um, and therefore to be rather higher than, than one would hope or expect a Scottish Government would need. Um, but, and it would necessarily need to be flexible, because it's going to have to... This is, going, this is something that would evolve. I mean, as we've, 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 we've been discussing... Um, in the context of no detriment, the tax situation can change after a few years. We have um, a very high deficit at the moment. We have a high deficit because we made, essentially because we maintained a constant or a somewhat increased level of public spending when tax receipts dropped very significantly. Um, and one's got to deal with the fact that if one's devolving tax powers, then those tax receipts are going to be, um, as it were, are going to be missing from the Scottish exchequer, not from the UK exchequer. And it's got to have the borrowing power able to cope with that adjustment. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We know that we can be reasonably brief. Um, Professor Trench, um, I was going to ask you about the issue of, of um, Barnet conversions because yes. when we're de debating introducing a, um, a needs based formula, say, so, well, eventually this might not be too particularly detriment to Scotland because ultimately Barnet conversions will be a uh, complete lobby parity of spend. And you'll t you, but you said that that would take quite a long time. Do you have any more well, details on, on actually how long that period might um, be? I think that, that my, my slightly glib answer might be asked me again in July uh, once we've seen that the UK That seems very budget. short amount of time to have more, <laughs> more information. Well, on, well what would it um, be? 
what, will dri what drives Barnet convergence is nominal increases in, in public spending. Um, and of course, those increases were, not mere, were, were both nominal and real, and they were huge during the noughties. Um, and that is why it is so remarkable that convergence did not happen during that time. If ever there were circumstances where convergence should have been happening, those are, th th those are, those are the circumstances. Um, I would suspect we're very unlikely to see a similar sort of increase in public spending for a very substantial period of time, or see a government able to, to engage in such an increase in public spending. So I'm, I would be fairly cautious in saying, oh, it will only happen, it'll happen in five years anyway, because I'd be fairly sure it won't. But it will, it will happen over time, assuming that, that Scotland remains as attractive a place to live as it, as it, as it seems to be, um, and therefore the population... Um, as it were, stops declining or even grows. Ms. Phillips, do you have any thoughts on that? I was going to say that, you know, I have, have no predictions about, you know, when the convergence actually takes place, but, you know, it's unusual for me to actually be in you know, agreement, but you know, the, the work that um, uh, Jim Cuthbert did in his submission, you know, kind of showing how the interactions of um, uh, expansion of growth population growth and the, and the lags between, you know, how often population is updated. I think that's a really good piece of work to show actually how these three things interact and um, what that implies for the, for the point at which they converge. You know, is it 100% or is it, you know, 105%, 110%? 110%. So I think, you know, that's a, a really good exercise to, to look at. Um, you know, it doesn't give you the answer because it doesn't tell you what spending growth will be in the next few years or what population growth will be, but you can probably run some scenarios uh, using forecasts for uh, population growth uh, in Scotland and, and, and England and uh, different projections, you know, the OBR's projections for what um, will be spending over the next, uh, you know, 50 years to see what kind of convergence you're looking at. So they're, they're introducing a new um, a needs-based formula, whatever new formula is over as part of this process, it presumably wouldn't be to the benefit of Scotland financially at all in terms of that timescale. Um, so, uh, looking at you know the next you know five ten years, it's unlikely you'd have convergence down to a level below uh, 105 percent, which is I think what um, the Hobson Commission said uh, the needs-based level would be. However, you know, as I said we haven't done a needs-based uh, assessment at the IFS, uh, and you know, it, it's not clear what the needs-based level would be at the moment. So, you know, I I agree that. Um, in the short to medium term, it's difficult to see yep. a, a needs yep. assessment which would lead to higher funding than Scotland currently gets. Um. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. And finally, um, you know, in, in the absence at the moment of a, a, a group of individuals um, appointed presumably by both the Scottish and UK governments to help mediate over disputes between governments, um, uh, I mean, the point you've made, Professor Trench, you know, it's very important, therefore, that in terms of scrutiny of how the, the Joint Exchequer Committee works or doesn't work or doesn't meet. It's very important that this committee and select committees, presumably also in Westminster, um, play a close scrutiny to that. And, and, and presumably, yes. therefore, there should be standing items, in fact, for committees both here it, uh, in, and in indeed. Westminster. Indeed. And, and I, mean, part, I think part of the issue at Westminster is, of course, that responsibility for these matters is fragmented between a number of departmental select committees, um, in particular between Treasury Select Committee and the Scottish Affairs Committee. Um, and ensuring that it's a high enough profile, particularly for Treasury Select Committee, um, is, 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 I think, something of a challenge. They've not shown much interest in devolution issues until very recently, uh, the, toward the fag end of the, the last parliament. They started to do some work on this. Uh, but presumably it's also be appropriate for the Scottish Affairs Select Committee to... One would expect to, so, to, to particularly given its likely composition in the new parliament. One would uh, expect that they would be, be particularly that. vigilant. Thank <laughs> you, <laughs> Uh, Richard, uh, that's uh, concluded questions from the committee. But just one point: you talked about the, you know, Scotland's population declining 0.3% a year in the, the kind of 90s and 0.1% now. But Scotland's uh, population is at record level. It's actually grown in recent years. It, 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 the, the decline went into reverse for a couple of years, mm. as, as I recall, mm. around 2007. Um, and that's it's, uh, this is a question of a relative decline rather than an absolute decline. Okay. Thank you for that. Well, uh, thank you very much for um, once again answering our questions um, so directly. Uh, um, that concludes this session, and uh, I'm now going to call a recess until 11.30 to allow members a natural break and have a change of witnesses.
Thank you very much.
Okay, we shall reconvene uh, the session. Uh, our next um, item of business is to take evidence from Scottish Government officials in relation to the Education Scotland Bill's financial memorandum. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting uh, Douglas Anstall, Laura Meikle and Scott Wood. Uh, members have received copies of a briefing paper along with all written evidence received. So we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And as uh, normally happens, I'll ask the initial questions and then we'll move on to questions uh, from uh, the committee. So, first one is, uh, in terms of their evidence, um, Kozlov said, and I quote, the bill proposes new duties on local authorities, and these require to be fully funded by the Scottish Government. So, given that these additional burdens on local authorities, why has the Scottish Government not agreed to fund them? Question in relation to a, a specific set of provisions within the bill, because there are different arrangements for well, each it, of the, the parts. Well, new duties that the bill is imposing... Okay. You know, specific, if, if there are new duties being imposed, uh, I mean, I remember well over a decade ago, for about 15 years ago in the first uh, session of the Parliament, there was a kind of general view that uh, if the Scottish Government or the Scottish Executive then was were imposing new burdens and new duties on go local government, uh, that they should actually fund those uh, new duties rather than miraculously expect the local government to find them from their own resources. But here we are, you know, in, in, in the fourth parliament and we're still having the same situation whereby the government uh, puts forward a bill, there's going to be an impact on local government and what they've said is, well, we'll partially fund it, but somehow you're going to have to find it from your existing resources. So, so it's a wider issue, but, but rather than look at a specific area in the bill, I mean, we could talk about Gaelic provision if you like, where there's a 75, 25% uh, you know, expectation in terms of Scottish government, local government funding in terms of capital. But just generally, why is the bill proposing new duties on local authorities but not actually funding them? May I, may I respond to this one, please, sure. from the, the Gaelic point of view? And I think in particular this has been a line that COSL have taken with us, that this is a new duty, therefore it needs to be uh, fully funded. And um, I think I'd bat that straight back. We don't recognise that. The duty on local authorities has been in legislation since 1918. In the 1980 Education Act, there was a provision that children should be educated in line with the wishes of their parents. Uh, many parents wishing Gaelic medium education have used that provision in the 1980 Education Act that children should be educated in line with the wishes of the parents. There's Gaelic provisions in the 2000 Education Act. There's Gaelic provisions in the 2005 Gaelic Act. Uh, where Gaelic plans can be prepared with commitments in them. What we're doing here is putting in place a process that will hopefully, hopefully uh, go, as going ahead, be a transparent, a consistent and a timed process that will enable parents to put forward their request to local authorities for Gaelic medium education. So I wouldn't see this as a new duty. It's, it's putting a new structure, a new shape in there, but it's, it's the, the duty that is already there on local authorities to provide education and indeed to provide Gaelic education if that should be the wishes of the parents. Okay, thank you for that. But, but the capital costs, the local authorities are expected in paragraph 38 to cover 25% uh, of the cost to that. I mean, I, I, the, the question remains why they why they, they expected to pay additional funding for that. Um, we, we have two grant schemes uh, in principle to support Gaelic education in, in local authorities. And, and, of course, before mentioning the, 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 gr the grant schemes, it is reasonable and legitimate that Gaelic education should be funded from uh, you know, the local government settlement because, after all, it is just education of young people in schools, and that's legitimate. The two grant schemes we have, one for revenue and one for capital funding, and we are open and, indeed, we're, we welcome bids from local authorities for both capital or for revenue to help with the expansion of Gaelic medium education. The, 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 the question of, of what support a local authority needs if they want to advance or expand Gaelic education varies greatly. Sometimes the request will simply be we could benefit from some capital help in order to buy some port academies, re renovate some rooms for the Gaelic medium classes. So sometimes the, the request is capital and we look towards our resources to assist with that. Sometimes it might be revenue. Could we help with the provision of some support uh, for, for a salary for a teacher or various things like that? 
Sometimes the request doesn't come and a local authority is quite content to proceed to establish Gaelic medium education in its area and from uh, the resources already received. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Now, in paragraph uh, 41, um, it says in the financial memorandum, the process for local authority to respond to parental requests could be managed by two local authority officers as part of their workload over a period of about 14 weeks. This cost has been estimated at £25,000 uh, per annum per request. Why is it such a huge amount of money? That seems an awful lot of money um, to spend. Well, on I... That. I, I this was a tricky one, and it's us stepping into someone else's working life and trying to guess how much time this would take in their working life. And we thought, well, here we are. We're putting in, the provisions are putting in place a process. The process will need to be managed within the local authority, and the process will involve the local authority working with the parents that have put in the request. And so we just thought, what percentage of their working day would this take and what salaries would these officials be likely to be in, in receipt of and so in talking to local authority colleagues we try to establish the, the, the burden that this would involve, the time it would involve um, the amount of work uh, following through the process and try to base our um, estimate on these and, and, and came with that figure as best we could from these, these elements. It just seems a colossal amount of money to process a request for someone to get Gaelic and medium education, unless I'm missing something here. Well, well mm. what, what we're costing there is the salary, the, sal the percentage of the salary of the individuals doing the jobs. And so uh, if, if we... Yeah, but what is, what is, a, what is this, the colossal bureaucratic nature of this that it takes... £25,000 worth of salary. I mean, how many countless hours are they spending on this? I mean, I, I, I don't understand why it's taking so many hours to process such something. Someone applies for their child to get Gaelic medium education, and you're saying it's going to take two officers 14 weeks, you know, to do this. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that processing a request of any nature would take that amount of time and that amount of money. And, and obviously that's made cause them nervous because obviously they're saying, well, the, the, the estimate is only going to be one of these requests a year. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there could be half a dozen, a dozen, who knows. Uh, but they just seem to be... Well, what, what, why is it so... What have they got to do if these people got to, you know... I don't know. Well, th there are reports that need to be written, and that will take official time. There's information that needs to be brought in from education bodies such as Education Scotland and from Gaelic bodies such as Borden um, and Gaelic. And, and, and this, th there will be, of course, working with elected members and local authorities, putting advice forward, preparing papers. And this will all was take a percentage of the officer's time. And for that, we try to calculate... Uh, a, a percentage of their salary that, 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 that this would amount to. However, in addition to this, I think it's worth mentioning that if we put in, pro, in, in place a process that will be over uh, in, say, for example, 10, 14 or 15 weeks, that will be a much shorter and less burdensome process than what's happening at the moment. Because in some areas of the country, there have been examples and this is referred to in the SPICE paper on the bill, there have been examples where, where parents have been no knocking at local authority doors for six, seven, eight, nine, and ten years for Gaelic medium education. This would also take up a long time in local authority business, and if we added that up, I think that might add to a much higher cost for, of, of officials' time. So I, I think there is an argument here that this is leading to a, a timed, transparent uh, process that will be much cheaper uh, on local authority time. Okay. Uh, I won't explore that further. Colleagues may wish to if they uh, may wish to. Um, table 4, I know we've had corrections on the figures, but in terms of Table 4, what I notice about it is, is that the, 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 the funding for children's rights will, will um, be £187,000 in financial year 16-17 and then stabilise at £330,000 for 17-18 up until 2020-21, but the, the, in, in terms of Gaelic medium education, you're, look, you're expecting a year-on-year -year increase in that. Why actually is that, and is this, and is that going to continue to increase ad infinitum, or do you believe that 2020-21 is going to be the last year in which the, that, the sums continue to increase? Mm -hmm. um, the increases that we have down there is, is um, in, in the in the Gaelic medium, Gaelic, Gaelic side. I think the, 
we'd suggest the increase is there because if, if a local authority opens up Gaelic medium support, they will be looking for support with things such as the salary of a teacher or, for example, the transport of, of children to school. If they look for that support in, in, in for example, uh, 1819, the same authority might look for the same support the following year, 1920, but there might be another local authority looking for similar support for the salary of a teacher or for transport to school. And so we see the figure going up in terms of new uh, or other authorities coming forward, opening Gaelic medium provision. There are other, other things go on in the background as well. Very often a local authority might look to the Scottish Government for support for example, with a, a, a Gaelic teacher's salary, but a few years down the road, the local authority might say, we'll mainstream this, this salary now. And so there is movement in the, the support that is given from Scottish government to local authorities. And sometimes something that might be considered a burden uh, or a little bit additional support for one, two or three years might be main mainstreamed by the local authority after a few years. Okay, thank you for that. And just uh, one final point before we open out the session. Uh, to colleagues, um, which is that there are concerns, and it's mentioned in the financial report itself, about the availability of teachers. What, what kind of level of constraint do you think there is in terms of uh, implementing this policy vis-à-vis -vis the availability of teachers? I, I think the, the availability of Gaelic teachers has always been a, a, a serious concern, and it affects some areas more than others. Um, there are a number of new measures that are being put in place to increase the number of teachers, Gaelic teachers, been attracted into the profession and been placed in, in Gaelic classes. The numbers over the last three years have been higher uh, than they have ever been in terms of uh, teachers going through the system, and we have more routes into Gaelic medium teaching than we've ever had before. So we're making good progress, numbers are better, yet it remains a, a, a serious concern that we continue this work that, and that all parties, uh, local authorities, Scottish Government, Scottish Funding Council, universities, Board of Gaelic, uh, are, are all work together as, as positively as possible to try and address the, the, this issue. But yes, it is a concern. So say, for example, just, just on, on that point, if um, uh, someone in, say, the Scottish Borders wanted Gaelic medium education of their child, it's not an area where one would anticipate there'd be a, a surplus of uh, Gaelic teachers or any Gaelic teachers. What, what kind of process would you have to go through? You would have, the council would then have to recruit a specific teacher to that local authority. What kind of, what kind of time scales are we talking about for effectively the rollout of this policy in mm -hmm. such a case? Uh, I know it's difficult to be precise because mm -hmm. you would obviously have to recruit an individual and persuade them to move to that part of Scotland. But what kind of, um, what, what kind of concerns do you have about that and how would that be addressed? Well, I think we'd approach it as we would approach uh, a need in any other area of the country, uh, even, even uh, in, in some areas that you might think would be more familiar with, 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 with Gaelic language, still have needs to recruit Gaelic teachers. And the, the, the ways that the local authority could approach it, they could approach it just in the standard way of putting a, an advert in, in the press or putting the advert to Board na Gaelic that, have a, a, that keep a, a register of, of teacher needs. They, they could look for uh, a probationer coming through the system um, to, to step in uh, and, and support Gaelic teaching. Or else they could try, and, uh, if you like, to, to, to grow their own. There might be teachers living and working in Borders Council area that are Gaelic speakers, and they might consider transferring over to, to teaching in Gaelic. There is a course available, a one-year course, called GIFT Gaelic Immersion for teachers whereby local authorities can um, put forward teachers that are able to speak Gaelic but are currently teaching in English and so it is possible for local authorities to to retrain and place somebody who might be one of their own teachers in a Gaelic medium classroom so standard route of adverts retraining uh, selecting a probationer uh, there are different routes that the local authority could follow and either ourselves in Scottish Government or colleagues at Borden Gaelic would be very, he help, uh, very happy to advise and support in any way we could in this. Yeah. But uh, I say teachers remains a, 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 a concern for us. Indeed. I mean, I just used Borders as an example. I don't, don't know what the current situation is in that area. I just picked it randomly. But 
but um, just uh, but what you're saying is it could be a year or two before, even if there's a duty on local authority to provide Gaelic medium education, it could still be a year or two before a child is actually able to be taught in a Gaelic unit because of these issues. First of all, the capital has to be found to, to build a unit. Secondly, a teacher has to be recruited, etc. And we have to go through this process. Is that correct? Well, th th these are are are, are just. Um, perhaps issues, it might be the case that if there was a parental request in, in Scottish borders uh, for Gaelic medium education, and if we followed this process through, if there was sufficient uh, parents wanted their children educated in, in, in Scottish borders, it's possible that there might be a school that was suitable, that had adequate accommodation for Gaelic medium classrooms. Uh, it, it's, it's also possible that an advert could go in the, in the press and a teacher could be recruited. So the, there's not necessarily a delay in this process, but the, the way we've constructed the provisions in the bill, there is, there's an, an initial assessment and a full assessment, and we'd hope that in the, in the full assessment that the local authority would have the opportunity to explore these issues in, in depth and come to a, a, a judgment as to whether it was reasonable to establish Gaelic education in that area. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. I'm now going to open up the session to the first person to ask a question will be the Deputy Convener, to be followed by Malcolm. Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, just to, to follow on what we've been talking about so far with the Gaelic, I did get the impression from some of the responses that... Uh, you know, they're, they're hopeful, and presumably the government is also hopeful, that there's going to be quite a serious expansion of interest in Gaelic through this. And uh, is it Borna Gaelic uh, talk about, um, in all likelihood, giving rise to additional requests beyond normal levels? And uh, I think one or two others, uh, COSLA as well, uh, talk about expecting the bill to lead to faster growth in GME throughout Scotland. Uh, this statement does not seem consistent with the estimate in the financial memorandum, and I think the other one was Fife, which I picked up, mm -hmm. uh, which says the potential for expansion in the period covered by the FM is modest and potentially understated. Um, are we being too cautious and pessimistic about how much interest there might be? Well, I think all we can do here is, is look at the, the growth we've had in the last little while and the interest that we believe is out there. Now, I can tell you what growth we've had, for example, and, and it's in the, in, in the papers relating to the bill. We have had three new... I, actually, let, let me stop myself there and say there, there has been growth in, in Gaelic education generally. The numbers are going up. The numbers going into primary one are increasing. And in, in, in a number of areas, what are Gaelic units are expanding to be Gaelic schools. So there is growth generally. But if we address the, the question of how many new units have been established, then I say there's been, th there's been three new units established in the last six years. Now, we, we expect that, that the provisions of this bill will lead to an increased rate of growth. Now, as you picked up from the papers and from the responses, a number of other uh, res uh, respondents have also said we expect this will lead to an increased rate of gro growth. Um, Borden Gaelic said this will probably lead to an increased uh, a rate of growth above normal. Now, our, our, our estimate is that not that you know, the lid's going to come off and, and this is going to, to lead to requests everywhere. We still think that this will be modest growth. So if at the moment we've got three new units every six years, uh, which is in effect one unit every two years, an increase in growth would be one new unit every year. And for, for Gaelic medium education, which is a very small sector of Scottish education, this would be a, a, well, well, it would be, it would be a very good result. It would lead to uh, a significant growth in the Gaelic education sector. So uh, our best estimates are looking at what's there or what, what growth we've had over the last six or seven years and estimating that this bill will lead to an increase. But our estimate is that it's not going to be anything more than modest growth of perhaps one request per year. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, right, to move on to the uh, idea of uh, compulsory registration, uh, GTCS, um, I see in their response 
that uh, they're kind of questioning the figures. For example, it's not just a one-off uh, cost at the beginning. There would be uh, ongoing costs. And also, um, the Scottish Council for Independent Schools uh, talks about what kind of training uh, existing teachers might need. And they quote figures, for example, the University of Buckingham which I assume is not the cheapest place in the world, eh, at £3,995 per person. Eh, so I'm just wondering, you know, have we got enough costs built in there? Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of issues there eh, to respond to. Firstly, in relation to the GTC's evidence and some of the costs that they've in, eh, sort of highlighted, I suppose, um, in terms of preparing for the, the commencement of these provisions. Um, I think it's important to recognise that the, the independent sector have got a long-standing commitment to work towards registration on a voluntary basis. And certainly some of the activity that has been described in the GTC's submission, we understand has been ongoing and forms part of the programme of work to support that transition towards registration. However, we do recognise that um, the imposition of timescales through the bill could well impact on how and when that money is spent. Um, and we're more than happy to have a conversation with the GTC um, about how we can support them in that transition uh, in advance of commencement. So um, in relation to the, the GTC costs, that's the, the position that we're adopting. Um, in relation to the costs associated with perhaps training uh, as, as teachers work towards registration, um, our view is that we need to take as flexible an approach for the purposes of the transitional arrangements as we possibly can. Um, so we've got discussions scheduled with the GTC and the Scottish Council for Independent Schools to uh, agree the transitional arrangements. Uh, we don't want to preempt those discussions but as I say we want to be as flexible as possible and some options for us include uh, of course teachers looking to secure additional qualifications and um, we're also looking at establishing perhaps alternative categories of registration which would perhaps allow existing teachers in the independent sector to continue working in their current post or in that sector perhaps without the need to secure an additional qualification and instead perhaps focusing on uh, an assessment of the existing skills and knowledge that that individual has. So am I right in saying that some teachers would be closer to what they needed for registration than others? Yes. I mean, I think we, we anticipate in total that this, um, this policy will impact on around 700 teachers. Um, now, there's a, a, a sort of a, a range of uh, qualifications held by those teachers. Ultimately, the best route to registration for each of those teachers will, depend on, will be dependent on the qualifications that they have, the skills, the knowledge, the experience, and, of course, the longer-term plans, whether or not they, they, they intend to continue working in their current post. Um, in the independent sector or if they have plans for working in the state sector at some point in the future, for example. Okay, thank you. And the third area I wanted to touch on was the, um, the attainment level of pupils from most deprived backgrounds and so on. Uh, South Lanarkshire make the interesting comment that um, how it all ties together. We've got the Scottish Attainment Challenge Fund with 100 million. Um, they're saying a bit of lack of... Uh, transparency how that money has been allocated and if that money is connected to the bill and the getting it right for every child agenda so they've kind of put, got three things there are yeah. they all related to each other well they are they, they form part of a sort of broader package of measures that we're taking forward to uh, narrow the attainment gap there's been an awful lot of focus placed on this in recent times in relation to the attainment scotland fund my understanding is that the funding has been directed to those education authorities with the highest concentrations of uh, deprivation um, however, we are also actively considering how else we can support disadvantaged communities elsewhere in the country, and those discussions are ongoing. Um, as I say, this, this um, provision does form part of a package of measures. You'll be aware that we are uh, currently looking to recruit 32 attainment advisors to support local authorities across the country. Uh, we're also looking to establish literacy and numeracy hubs. Um, and we've got an ongoing programme of work, the Raising Attainment for All programme, which is designed to really help us understand what works and develop our evidence base around narrowing the attainment gap. So, yes, the, the, the due regard duty, which is included in the bill, does form part of a broader package of measures and a universal approach to narrowing the attainment gap. OK, thanks so much. OK, thank you. Uh, Malcolm, to follow by Gavin. Well, I mean, that's the area that I was going to ask about, so you, you, in a sense you've answered it already, but I suppose, I suppose it was a bit of the bill that I was most interested in and, and thought, without being, um, without being dismissive of the other sections, I think it's by far the most important part of the bill, promoting equity of attainment for disadvantaged children and closing the attainment gap. So I was very surprised that there was absolutely <laughs> no sum of money attached to it. It did seem rather... Rather odd, and um, I, I mean, uh, um, obviously there has been some money announced for seven local authorities, so I suppose that will help in those areas. But it, it seems odd that you, 
in a kind of way it almost downgrades the, the duty if there's no resources um, con as, um, you know, consequent upon it. That's probably not something that, that we would agree with necessarily. Um, I think it's important to reflect on the, the increased priority um, and the increased resource which has been directed towards addressing this particular challenge in recent times. And I've touched on some of the developments which have taken place. You mentioned the, the Attainment Scotland Fund and the £100 million that's being invested through that fund. But um, as I've already mentioned, we're also committed to the appointment of 32 attainment advisors across the country, the establishment of the literacy and numeracy hubs, and we've been delivering the Raising Attainment for All programme for some time now. Um, so given the level of priority that's now being attached to this issue, it's our view that if we were placed under a duty of this nature at this point, then we would be satisfying it. I suppose that the purpose of the duty is to ensure that the level of priority that has now been placed on this issue is maintained and that the momentum that we're developing is, is sustained moving forward. I mean, it does raise uh, interesting general issues about the nature of financial memorandums. I mean, if, if this bill had come out a year ago, would you, would you have put some money attached to it? Or is, is, it, is the reason you're not putting money to it is because you've already announced money for it? Or is there no intrinsic necessity for more money in order to achieve that objective? Well, I think when it comes to preparing the financial memorandum, we need to make an assessment of the, the investment that's currently being made at the point at which we're drafting the financial memorandum. Uh, the range of initiatives which are taking place and then based on that evidence form of view about whether or not we think additional investment would be required to satisfy that duty and that's the process we've gone through for the purposes of this financial memorandum but it is particularly interesting in this case because although there's a substantial sum of money it's only going to seven local authorities so from somebody in some other local authority might say how are we supposed to achieve this particular objective well i would just go back to the point that the the attainment scotland fund is only one part of a package of measures that we are taking forward to uh, support every local authority across the country and narrowing the attainment gap. But I go back to the, the 32 attainment advisors, the Raising Attainment for All programme, which involves 23 of the 32 local authorities in over 180 schools at the moment. So we do have a, a universal approach to addressing this issue. However, we have targeted some resources towards those those local authorities who have the highest concentration of, of deprivation. And as I say, discussions are ongoing about how we can support those other local authorities who face challenges as well. Mm. But if, even in the narrative of the financial memorandum, you would, you would have expected some of that to have been described. You know, it, it's, just, it's just very striking that the most important part of the bill gets five lines on a one-off cost of £50,000, you know? I mean, hopefully the, the evidence that I've offered today brings some clarity around mm -hmm. the approach we're adopting to this issue and why we've set out the figures that we have in the financial memorandum. OK, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Gavin, to follow by Jean. Sure, thanks. I, mean, I, I want to, to, to pursue a similar issue, maybe just with some slightly different specifics. Um, you're saying the, in the financial memorandum, you say the estimated total costs of the bill's provisions are, and so for financial year 16-17, which is the first year, it's 254000 goes up to 560,000 and by 2020, 2021, it's 736,000. Now, those are amended slightly, I guess, by the uh, addendum you've said today, but by yes, about 50,000 50, or so. So th those figures are broadly in the same ballpark. Um, in terms of the... So you're, you're saying the total cost of the provisions are, are what are in the financial memorandum. Um, obviously, you're not going to narrow any attainment gap by investing £736,000. I mean, that's presumably not going to, to have any impact. So you talk about you brought this £100 million in. Can you tell me of this, this £100 million figure, is that an annual figure? Or for each of the five years on the financial memorandum, how many millions should we actually really add to those columns so that we see how much is being invested? Well, I think in relation to the £100 million that's been invested through the Attainment Scotland Fund, that's over the life of the fund, which I think is five years, um, or perhaps four years, I think it is. Sorry, I can write to the, the committee and clarify that particular point. Um, I mean, there's a range of activity already, already going on within local authorities to, to seek to narrow the attainment gap. I've touched on some of the, the national activity, but um, local authorities are delivering services in a way which seeks to address these challenges all the time. I think what we're focusing on the for the purposes of the financial memorandum are the costs directly associated with the, uh, the new legislative proposals that we're bringing forward. Mm -hmm. OK. C can you tell us, then, when you write to us, just how, how much additional money is going in in each of, each of the financial years set out by the, set out by the bill? We, we can certainly write to you with further information on the um, Attainment Scotland Fund, if okay. that would be helpful. That would be very helpful. And secondly, really just, it's really to follow up on what the question Malcolm Chisholm asked. Initially, you're, you're saying you don't need to worry about these figures that are low on this bill because we're throwing in this extra £100 million. 
but initially at least through this attainment fund there will be literally zero pounds going to anyone other than the seven local initially anyone other than the seven local authorities so what what additional money will go to the other 25 local authorities who will have a legal duty placed upon them under the act but at least in year one they're not getting any of this 100 million again i think it's important not to focus solely on £100 million Attainment Scotland. Sure, no, there I'm are not, a range okay. of measures that we're taking forward in partnership with all local authorities across the country with a view to narrowing the attainment gap. Now, what we've set out in the financial memorandum uh, is the cost associated with the nature of the duty that we're placing on local authorities. Now, given that we're taking forward this broad package of measures designed to support local authorities in narrowing the gap, we are not of the view that there necessarily will be any costs associated with uh, the legal duty that's included in the financial memorandum, so long as the level of priority that we're currently placing uh, on addressing this issue is maintained moving forward. And that's really the purpose of the duty, I suppose, is to ensure that that priority continues to be attached to, to this issue. OK. Let, let me phrase it another way, then. If, if, if this bill is passed in, in its current form, which I guess many would anticipate, there is a duty under Part 1 on the local authorities to... Um, reduce inequalities of educational, educational outcomes and narrow the attainment gap. So once the bill is brought into law, which uh, would appear to be 2016, that, that duty is imposed on local authorities. Yep. All right? um, some local authorities will benefit, or seven of them will benefit from this attainment fund, presumably in 2016 initially. So my, so my question is, for the other 25 local authorities, the um, duty will be placed upon them from 2016 but what additional you're saying there are other measures there but it's not clear what they are what what additional yeah. money is linked to this bill that will be required by the other 25 local authorities in, in order to fulfill the duty i mean it's really the question the convener asked i guess right at the start what i can't see is how these other 25 are getting any extra additional funding mm -hmm. to, to deliver on these duties which we all want them to yeah. deliver upon I think the first thing to, to sort of touch on, I suppose, is the purpose of the duty that we're looking to bring forward. The purpose of the duty is to ensure that due regard is given to the desirability of addressing this issue. Now, um, the, the purpose of the duty is really to ensure that where resources are being allocated, decisions are being made, that a degree of priority is, a, is attached to narrowing the attainment gap, if you like. Um, now, we recognise that local authorities work in uh, a financial envelope in a context and they have a, a limited budget to allocate. Um, and, and indeed, the duty itself takes account of that. A due regard duty suggests that a de degree of priority needs to be attached to an issue, but that, that, that the other factors can also be taken into account when reaching decisions. And obviously, one of those factors are the finances that are available to local government. So um, we, we recognise that they're working within a budget. It's about how they use that budget that's available to them um, to place particular emphasis on the need to address this, this issue. Um, I've already touched on some of the other activity that we're taking forward with uh, local authorities across the country designed to support them in progressing uh, their work in this area. Uh, so there's not really much more I could add on the back of that at this point. OK, not, not here today, but I mean, is, is, you're going to let us know about the, the attainment fund, but you, 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 you talk about these fund, other yeah. things that are happening. It is, yep. You don't need to give me them all right now, but it, could that be given to us as well? so that we could, so that, I, I'm, At the moment, I, I just can't yeah. see how local authorities that aren't getting attainment fund money can actually make progress in this, in this duty, which will be a statutory duty from mm -hmm. 2016. On the face of it, um, they're getting between them, uh, aside from the attainment money, you know, 67 grand between 32 local authorities in, in year one and 104 grand in year two. Now, I'm sure there must be more work being done and you are actually giving them more through other measures, but it's not mm. clear to me what, what those other measures I mean, are. The local government settlement provides funding to support a range of public services and those include obviously education services. So there is money going out to local authorities. What we're saying is that in delivering education provision in your area, you need to attach a degree of priority to addressing this issue moving forward. And at the national level, we're taking forward uh, a sort of package of measures designed to support, support them in achieving that. And as I say, I won't run through the range of activity that we're undertaking again today, but I'm certainly happy to write to the committee, setting some of that out in more detail and talking about our plans for the, the Attainment Scotland Fund. Yeah, because that, I mean, that's what I asked for. That, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, thank okay. you. I mean, you talked about these 32 uh, attainment advisors, but is raising attainment not already the job of teachers, heads of department, head teachers and directors of education? And surely, if there's a real issue in terms of attainment, they should already be focusing on that on a classroom, department, school and uh, local authority level. 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, what we're trying to do through the, the appointment of attainment advisors is, is, is to support local authorities in identifying what works best to, identify, uh, to address sorry, the particular challenges that some children will face in relation to their attainment. So it's providing that additional capacity, that knowledge and expertise to support their considerations. I think uh, we get a clear sense that local authorities are currently um, attaching a greater degree of priority to addressing this issue. We get that that sense through the discussions we're having around the Scottish Attainment Challenge, for example, through, um, through the participation of uh, a significant number of local authorities in the Ra Raising Attainment for All programme. So we do get a sense that certainly there is a degree of urgency being attached to addressing this issue now. And I suppose the challenge for us is to ensure that this priority is maintained and perhaps that we get a, a better sense of, uh, or put in place more robust measures to allow us to, to measure the progress that we're making around all of this. So is there no sharing of best practice at the moment within schools, local authorities and across local authorities? And is that part of the work of the, these attainment advisors? Is that with it? No, I, I mean, we, we expect that there is. And certainly the, one of the key purposes of the Raising Attainment for All programme is to share that best practice, to test models for change and improvement, and then to share that practice across local authorities and across schools. So we've got 23 local authorities currently involved in that programme and 180 schools. And we're really looking to build on that activity and provide dedicated support and resource to every local authority across the country um, so that they can implement what works when it comes to narrowing the attainment gap. OK, thank you. Uh, Jean, to be followed by Mark. I think just a, a point of information, really, to go back, Mr. Ansel, to uh, you mentioned at one point that um, local authorities could mainstream Gaelic, what we referred to in the past as Gaelic medium education unit. Um, what are the financial implications for that? And are there, is there a tipping point? I mean, I know that there's a couple of schools now where the majority of children registering are going to be taught in the medium of Gaelic. And does that, you know, there's the, the argument about, does that mean the school is a Gaelic school with an English-speaking, uh, English medium unit? Mm -hmm. But what would, what, what would... I think there's, um, there's a couple of things uh, in, in, in this. Um, the, the mainstreaming of Gaelic costs is, is something that, 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 of course, sits with local authority officers and... I, 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 um, I'm aware of conversations, for example, uh, local authority officers might say, in a Gaelic school we have five, six or seven teachers, uh, three or four of them are paid for by local authority uh, money, so their costs are mainstreamed, and we look to the government's specific grant to support the other two, three or, or, or four. Uh, and then as, as local authority officers work with, with Gaelic costs. Uh, for example, sometimes they might think about opening up new provision. And so within a local authority, discussions will go ahead about the mainstreaming of a, another teacher's salary and perhaps diverting a bit of specific grant from the government to, to some new provision. So I think the, the, the question of mainstreaming of costs and where a local authority might look to the Scottish Government for support is largely a discussion uh, that takes place within, within local authorities. And, and, and of course, we, uh, as requests for support come to us, we, we get involved in these discussions just to an extent. The, the, the other thing you were mentioning in, in that very often when Gaelic starts, there is a request for, it's seen as something additional, and so there is a request for support. In, in some areas of the country, the, the Gaelic side of a primary has increased to the extent that it is the majority. And there, there is recognition given for this now. In, 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 um, th th there's a phrase being used, Gaelic status schools. And, and we currently have nine primaries that are recognised as, as, as Gaelic status schools. Uh, whereby there, there is a significant majority of the pupils are receiving their lessons through the medium of Gaelic. That significant majority could be 60, 70, 80, and even 90% of the pupils are Gaelic medium pupils. Now, there, of course, is a, an argument there that when 90% or 80% of the pupils are receiving their education through the medium of, of Gaelic, it doesn't seem like it's something that needs additional support. It sounds like it's the mainstream activity in that school. Uh, and so this, this is 
something, it's a feature of, of our, our education system. It's a part of the discussion we're having with local authorities uh, and, and as the, some of them are moving towards recognising schools as Gaelic status schools, uh, we're, we're discussing that and what support is needed in that context with them. Thank you. To say I went to Belushan Academy in Glasgow and everyone in first year of secondary did Gaelic yeah. and I was one of 19 out of 350 who chose it over French actually from there on in uh, but it was just part of the it was just part of the mainstream mm. at the time uh, for anybody who actually lived in that area it wasn't that it was a special school for people who were interested it was just a, an ordinary school in South Glasgow and uh, you know we we, 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 we took it because uh, the education authority at that time decided it was part of our, our, our culture and apparently it was the only school in Glasgow that did that. It was a traditional kind of, kind of thing. Unfortunately, that no, that no longer happens. Mm -hmm. um, Mark. Th thank you, Camino. Just very briefly, um, obviously an area in which I have a particular personal and political interest is around additional support needs. And uh, I note the, uh, the extension of uh, rights to cover uh, children with uh, additional support needs. Um, you state at para 48 of the financial memorandum, um, uh, some costs may be associated with these rights which are currently unknown. Um, and also at para 47, it has not been possible to accurately assess the cost of extending rights and an estimated amount has not been included in this memorandum. Evidence that we've received from East Lothian Council uh, states um, that uh, as a result of increasing ASN rights, this will increase ASN referrals as a whole. And they also refer to uh, an 88% increase in ASN referrals over the last five school sessions. So while I understand that uh, I should point out that Fife and South Lanarkshire Council have estimated minimal cost, but that's based simply on the process of the tribunal uh, element and not maybe the decisions in terms of placings etc that may have to flow as a result of that so is the cost that you've estimated purely based on the tribe or, or, the, or, or the costs that you would be looking at purely based on the tribunal element and that process or does it also consider the knock-on effect from that of potentially uh, having to allocate additional ASM places within the, the school the, the costs that the, the process that we went through to try and establish um, the costs were actually based across all the rights, not on the tribunal um, alone. Um, I'm aware of obviously of East um, Lothian um, Council's position. Um, I think it's based. I think there's a premise um, possibly within that, which is the belief that um, children and their parents will use their rights, whereas it'll be one or the other. It won't be both. Um, people using their rights. Um, the reason that we have come to the position that we have in the um, in the financial memorandum, where, where we indicate that we we don't expect that, that there will be a significant amount of costs, is, is based on the experiences of the, the Welsh Tribunal, where children have had rights in Wales only for the Tribunal for um, a, a pilot period, and they were not used at all. Um, and also the experience of our own tribunal where um, disability discrimination claims have been able to be made by um, children um, with capacity, which would generally be about the age of 12, and they haven't been used at all either. So whilst we um, recognise that, that there may be some additional costs, we, we are not expecting um, the level of um, requests or um, use of those rights to be in the, the order at which perhaps East Lothian Council have suggested. And I think that, that the estimates we have given are, are possibly on the, the high side um, within, within our calculations beca because we haven't been able to accurately tie down exactly how many children may use their rights going forward, um, mm. partly because we weren't able to establish the cost <coughs> of rights, but also because of the experience of other jurisdictions. Um, we haven't been able to, to build that model and therefore we've, mm -hmm. we've erred on the side of caution um, in that. But I think also you, you, you'll see it at paragraph 48, because of that, um, we've had to indicate that, that we'll review um, as you would expect mm -hmm. um, going forward. I recognise that that's not a, a, a brilliant position to be in, but um, it's, it genuinely isn't for the lack of trying to, um, to, to nail these costs down. Um, we, we did try quite significantly to do that. Okay, I, I guess you know I, I see, and I see at para forty four you talk about parents currently have the rights to make these requests on behalf of yeah. their children. I guess there, you you could uh, 
put forward the suggestion how many parents are aware of the rights that they have in that respect mm -hmm. and is there the potential uh, well I would suggest there is the potential that uh, introducing this right might sharpen focus from people uh, into this area and therefore it may be that you perhaps underestimate what might come forward because any any legislation that, that creates a right or extends a right, by definition, draws attention to that right. Absolutely. And people who may, parents who may not previously have been aware that they had, the, that, that they had those rights or could exercise those mm -hmm. rights may now choose to take that opportunity or um, it, it may be pursued by, uh, you know. Uh, and so I guess the, the follow-up question really would be, what is, how early in the process are you going to have a look at what's happening and judge whether the behavioural change that you anticipate has actually uh, played out? Um, for the, in our discussions around these calculations, we also anticipated the exact point that you've made, that, that the fact that there's, there's a bill will draw attention, it may cause increases to the system in terms of parents currently, and it may allow... Um, may have there may be children who would use the rights who would not otherwise have done so or they couldn't up until now but who they may, may wish to instead of their parents using the rights um, and we factored that in um, the in terms of the review um, we will review immediately we, uh, we currently are under a duty to uh, Scottish Minister sorry are under a duty to report to Parliament each year on a number of elements including the cost of provision um, we are in discussions that that formal duty will conclude um, in next year, um, but we will continue to report and to record information about this type of information right the way through so that we've got a current picture and we'll also um, have a future picture from the moment that we commence these. We'll, we'll review from the moment one year on from the commencement of, of these bill provisions once they're commenced, if they are passed as they are. Okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. And I'm pleased to say that has uh, concluded our uh, deliberations on this particular issue. I'd like to thank you very much for your contributions uh, here this morning. I'll just have a 30-second break <coughs> uh, while um, uh, our witnesses depart, and then we'll move on straight on to Agenda Item uh, 4, which is to consider the following negative instrument. Uh, the Scottish Tax Tribunals, Time Limits and Rules of Procedure Regulations 2015, SSI 2015 uh, 184. session. Uh, before uh, we go any further, uh, you, you will all have received a letter from Nigel Dolan, MSP convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, in which she draws our attention to concerns of the committee. Uh, for example, the, the last but one paragraph says, and I quote, the setting of a limit for requesting permission to appeal to the Upper Tax Tribunal the Court of Session is a matter of considerable importance. It goes on to say that the committee was particularly concerned about the implications of shortening time limits for permission to appeal and how they would impact on the rights of those wishing to make an appeal. Um, so I'm happy to take comments from members of the committee. I know that the Deputy Convener, who is a member of that committee, certainly wishes to say something. Hey, John? Uh, thanks, Convener. Yes, I, th I think the committee did feel uh, quite strongly uh, about this because, I mean, as the government themselves have accepted, this is a matter of some importance about uh, people's right to appeal. Uh, I think there's a, a broad acceptance, as it says in the letter, that um, relaxing timescales, generally speaking, would give a, a person more rights, and, and, and that's not really a problem, and nobody's going to object to that. But I think the, the concern was more around a, allowing the tribunals to shorten the time limits that people could have to appeal. And, in fact, the suggestion was made... If there's, if there's no restriction on that, could they shorten it to five minutes? And, you know, that from 30 days, and, and that would, you know, obviously that's, you know, an extreme example, but that would seriously infringe on the rights of the person who could be making the appeal. So that's why the, the convener has written to you, convener, uh, because as the whole of the committee, we did feel uh, quite strongly that uh, this was uh, really pushing things too much. OK. 
Okay, any other comments from Gavin? I thought, I mean, I thought, that, I thought it was quite a good letter uh, from Nigel Donna. It certainly led me to, to look at it seriously. Um, my, my, own, my own view is that there's actually probably a drafting error in this document, um, the, the, the provisions, because the government are right to allow the, uh, the court or the tribunal to, to relax rules a bit is a discretion they have, but it's, it's, it's pretty unusual for them to allow them to shorten uh, the, the statutory uh, timescales that are laid out to protect, of course, those who are involved in the case. Um, so I just wonder, I mean, in the uh, regulation itself, it says extend or shorten the time for complying with rules, practice directions, or so on, um, or this time limit for permission to appeal. I, I just seriously wonder whether they actually didn't really mean shorten for the time limit for appeal. Um, it, it, would, it would strike me as odd. I mean, five, five minutes, as, as the deputy convener described, would be an extreme example. But even if, even if it were, you know, cut by a couple of weeks, that could put pressure, you know, presume on someone who does want to appeal and wants to take advice before doing so. So um, it, it's a negative instrument, obviously. So I suppose ultimately, as I understand it, there are two options. One is individual members can lodge a motion to annul with the chamber desk and uh, parliament look at that. Um, but one other option or one suggestion might be that we, we as a committee to invite the convener to, uh, to write to the minister outlining this point. I mean, we've not specifically taken evidence on this point, so mm -hmm. there's not that much we can add to what the uh, Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee can say, but given that they, they don't sort of write these kind of letters to us fairly regularly, given that there does seem to be, um, I think, a, a, a reasonable issue, um, my sort of preference would be that we, we write to them as a committee saying we've had this representation. There is a, there does appear to be um, a case to answer and uh, we, we seek the government's view on this. That's my... I mean, to be honest, that's exactly what my thoughts were when Jim and I discussed this actually yeah. before okay. and that was the, the line we thought was appropriate to take in this. It's, it's surprising we tend not to get any letters at all from Nigel Donnell. We've had them in successive weeks. So I do think that a letter to the Minister would be appropriate if colleagues are happy with that approach. Okay, thank you uh, for that. Okay, that now ends uh, the public uh, session. Uh, and uh, we'll just have another 30 second break to allow uh, public and official report to leave. <laughs>